Hi, and welcome back. Now, before we actually go into the course, as with all my other courses, I like to set the expectations right when it comes to what students are going to learn from this course. So I said this is a short course that is dedicated to understanding the networking aspect and the virtual private cloud. So this is a short course to help students understand this in more detail. Why do I always set the expectations right? Is because when students enroll in a course, they need to understand what they're going to learn. Now, obviously, if you want to learn more, I do have other courses which are also available on the Udemy platform. So if you want to learn the length and breadth of AWS, then obviously you have to go for a course which helps you get certified as an AWS Solution Architect Associate. In such courses, you will learn everything that is required to be known from an AWS perspective about all the services they have to offer. Now also in this course, I assume that you have at least some prior knowledge on what is cloud computing, at least some IT knowledge, and also you should be having a free tier account or any account with AWS if you want to practice along. So you should be already familiar on how you can log into AWS. And then from there, we're going to take it forward. I do have one chapter where I just show you how to create a free tier account. This is just for those students who have not created an account before. But as I said, you should at least have some prior experience on cloud computing, a little bit knowledge on AWS before actually moving forward. With all of that said and done and kept in mind, let's go ahead with this course. Hi and welcome back. Now just a little bit about myself. This is for those students who want to keep in touch with me through various communication channels. So just a little bit about myself first. I'm a big technology enthusiast. I've done certifications on the Amazon Web Services platform. So currently I have all the associate level certifications and I'm also certified as a security specialist. I'm also certified in Microsoft as well on the Azure platform. So I am certified as a Microsoft solutions expert on the cloud platform and infrastructure. I even work on creating question bank for various vendors. So I'm sure that if you have ever purchased question banks from reliable vendors, most probably it's been written by me. I've also done my certifications on the ITIL foundation and as a project management professional. And then currently I'm also managing my own startup. I also have publications on other platforms. I do get requested quite a lot to create different videos on different platforms. So again, for those who are interested in getting in touch with me, you can connect to me and message me on LinkedIn. Else you can also email me on alan at the rate cloud portal hub.com. So this is for those students who want to message me on a regular basis, who want to keep in touch. We can discuss technical issues. If you want, I can also send you updates on courses and new courses as well, because I know a lot of students want to learn about multiple technologies and cloud platforms. Sometimes interacting with students on the Udemy platform can be a little bit tricky. So I don't want to miss any messages. So that's why if you really want to get in touch with me, either connect with me via LinkedIn or send me an email on alan at the rate cloud portal hub .com. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, I am just going to go through how to create a free tier account in AWS. Now obviously as part of this course, I assume that you already have an account, you've already logged in, you already know a little bit about AWS before going into in depth into this course. But again, for those students who are not having an account in AWS, I'm just showing you how you can go ahead and create a free tier account in Amazon Web Services. So let's go ahead. So here I've just opened the documentation for the free tier, which is available from AWS. Now, in order to practice, in order to work with AWS resources, you need to create an account first. Now, there are different types of accounts that's available. But normally, if you're just fresh to AWS, if you're fresh to cloud computing, AWS gives you this ability to create something known as a free account. So in the free account, 
you get 12 months free worth of a certain number of services. After 12 months, you start getting charged for the usage of those services. Now, please also note that there are only certain number of services which are free. But let me tell you that this is quite good when you want to start using cloud computing resources. Let's take an example of EC2. So this is your virtual server on the cloud. You get 750 hours of running EC2 capacity. Let's go on and expand the details. Now in the details, please note that it says it's 750 hours per month of t2.micro instance. So this is an instance type. Anything that is different from this instance type. So let's say you choose a different instance type, you will be charged. So remember that this is only applicable to a t2.micro instance type. You'll actually understand this when we actually create our first EC2 instance. There it actually clearly shows you what is part of the free tier and what is not part of the free tier. So even though they give you free usage of a particular service, it's not sometimes across the board. So always be wary of that. Now what happens if you use another instance type? Well, you will be charged. So when you create the free account, you still need to specify a credit card. So this is because that if you by chance exceed the usage of a particular service, you will still be charged. So I didn't mention that this free account is free for a certain number of services for a certain extent. So it's not completely across the board. That is why you need to specify a credit card when you create a free tier account. Please make note of this. You can actually go through this entire page. I believe this has a resource to this chapter. You can see what are the different services which are provided to you free of cost. If you look at the simple storage service, you get 5 GB of standard storage, which is pretty good. So the lot of services which are good to start when using AWS. So my recommendation is that if you want to practice using AWS, start creating the free account. I also will put a chapter on costing. So you can actually see when you are going to exceed. So AWS has something known as a forecast. It can actually forecast based on your current usage if you are going to exceed the free tier usage. So this is a good aspect of AWS. So I encourage you all to create this free account so that you can actually start learning about AWS and cloud computing. That marks the end of this chapter. Let's move on to the next. Now, the first thing we're going to look at is the AWS global infrastructure. So now AWS has a presence over several geographic locations. So if you look at the map, this is where AWS has their data centers located. So if you look at the map, you will see several regions in which AWS actually has some sort of presence. So by presence, I mean that they would have set up a complete data center. In that data center, they would have physical hardware devices, which would then be used to host the underlying AWS resources, which we as the customer would make use of. Now, if you're working as an architect for an organization, it is very important for you to understand where all does AWS have their data centers. Why is this important? It's because it depends on a number of factors. So let's say your company is going to develop and deploy an application on AWS. And let's say all of the users who are going to use that application are in the Europe region. 
Now, if your users are located in Europe, it would be ideal and better to host your application in the Europe region. You would not want to host it in a region which is farther away from the customer because then it would take more time for the customer to reach your application. So let's say you have a web application hosted in AWS and you're hosting it in the Europe region. The customers in Europe would have the ability to reach the website in a shorter span of time. If it was hosted in a different location, it would have to make that call on to the AWS service in that remote location. So it's always important to understand where does AWS have their data centers. Then you as an architect will ensure that you create the resources in that particular region. Now as we go on with this course, when we start working and creating resources on the AWS cloud, you will become more familiar with regions and something known as availability zones. For the moment, just keep this in mind that you have regions across the world where AWS has their data centers. You can also see what are the new regions. So these are new initiatives by AWS to put their data centers in new regions in the world. Now, apart from that, another important concept is an availability zone. This is very, very important from an architect perspective. And we are going to look into this into more detail throughout this entire course. You will see this term popping up a lot when working with AWS services. Now we look at these numbers. So let's say Frankfurt has three, Island has three. What does this three mean? This three means the number of availability zones in that particular region. So just understand the concept that now a region also consists of multiple availability zones. We will actually as I said, discuss this in a later on chapter. So I'm going to attach this link as a resource to this chapter so that you can also see what is the global infrastructure for AWS. For now, this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome to the beginning of infrastructure design. Now it is very important from a solution architect perspective to understand the core concepts when it comes to networking in AWS. So we're going to go step by step. Now, if you've already done the cloud practitioner course and you're good in the networking components of AWS, then I suggest that you skip these chapters, go ahead to the subsequent chapters. So I'm actually trying to cater even to students who are not aware of the basic networking principles in AWS. And that's why I'm going through these set of chapters. So let's begin. Now, some of the core things we're going to look at first is basically a VPC, which is known as a virtual private cloud. And then we have EC2, which is elastic compute cloud. So let's imagine you have your AWS cloud network, right? So this is AWS exposing all their data centers to the internet, allowing us to host resources. Now in AWS, we've already gone ahead and created our own account. Now in this account, you can create something known as a VPC or a virtual private cloud. So this is your own small isolated network on the cloud. You're taking a small portion of the AWS cloud and you're allocating it to yourself, basically to your account. Now some key principles. Firstly, a VPC is mapped to something known as a region. Now we've looked at the global infrastructure in the prior chapter. We've seen the regions across the world in which AWS has their data centers. So when you create a VPC in your account, it will be mapped to a particular region. So let's say you have the EU region. Similarly, you can create more than one VPC or virtual private cloud. You could create another VPC either in the same region or you could create it in another region. So let's say you're creating it in the US region. And then you host your elastic cloud compute resources or your virtual machines 
in the VPC. Now, when we actually drill down into this, you're going to see that there's much more. But to start from an overall perspective, this is how it is. So you have your VPCs in your account, which are mapped to regions. And then you have the EC2 instances hosted in the virtual private cloud. Similarly, you could have another account. This could be owned either by you or by someone else. And in that account, again, you could have multiple VPCs. And in the VPC, again, you could host your EC2 instances. So this is how basically it works. AWS is allowing you to take a portion of their cloud to host the resources. Right, so this is part one of understanding VPC and the Elastic Cloud Compute Service. Hi, and welcome back. Now, I want to dedicate a couple of chapters just to explain IP addresses, CIDR blocks, routing in just a little bit more detail. This is for those students who are like new to IT who don't understand the networking concepts. If you are very familiar in networking, then you can actually skip these chapters. I suggest to cater to all of my students. For those who don't understand these basic concepts, I want to explain to them. So let's get started. Now over here, I just have two simple servers. They could be even clients. Now in order for servers to talk to each other, or even for a server to talk to the internet, you need to have something known as an IP address. It is this IP address that uniquely identifies a particular node. By node, I mean the server in this case. Now, even when you have your mobile phone, if you are connecting to the internet, automatically it will get an IP address. This IP address allows it to communicate with the internet. Similarly, if you have a tablet, an iPad, anything that needs to communicate with another device needs to have an IP address. So now to explain to you why do you need to have this IP address is because of how traffic gets routed from one node to another. In very simple terms, let's say this server needs to send a request to this server. Now in order for the request to flow, the request needs to understand where do I need to go. So the way it knows where it needs to go is to specify the IP address. So let's say this server is sending a request to this server. It needs to specify a destination IP address. So in here, the destination IP address will be 10.0.1.10. Similarly, this request needs to also attach what is the source, from where is the request coming from. Because this server needs to know, right, I'm getting a request. But who is sending me the request? What is the source? Let's say this server needs to reply back based on this request. It needs to know from where it is coming from. So that is mentioned in the source. So the source over here would be 10.0.1.20. Now all of this is a very small part of an entire packet of information that gets sent when a request goes from this server to this server. 
let's take an example let's say this is hosting a web application you're making a request from this server to this server to fetch a web page a simple HTML page so this is a request in that request a small part will be the source and destination IP address the rest of the packet contains information on what is the request details so for example what is the HTML page you are trying to request we're not going into that details I just want to explain to you the source and the destination in terms of the IP now normally all IP addresses are attached to something known as a NIC card or a network interface control card so this NIC card contains the information that is the IP address and other information and is responsible for ensuring it sends the information or the packet so the packet in the end is sent by the NIC card this NIC card is a separate device which is attached to your server or device or node basically now in AWS your server is nothing but your EC2 instance right and this NIC card is known as an ENI which is an elastic network interface so this is like having a virtual NIC card for your EC2 instance this NIC card would actually have the IP address now a NIC card can have multiple IP addresses now there is a clear distinction between two types of IP addresses first is something known as a private IP and nothing and the next so first is something known as the private IP and next is something known as the public IP what is the core difference the core difference is basically in the convention on how these IP addresses have been defined now private IP addresses are only used for internal communication so if servers need to communicate with each other within a particular network then they communicate via the private IP address but if this server needs to communicate with the internet or let's say you have a workstation so this could be my laptop so my laptop is also connected to the internet it needs to reach the server then this server needs to have something known as a public IP address now there are some standards already defined by an international organization which defines what are the range for public routable addresses on the internet and what should be the range for private IP addresses and that's why when you look at AWS or any other cloud platform when you look at the IP address ranges you will see clear distinctions between private IP addresses and public IP ranges and that's because these standards have already been defined a long time ago on what should be the public IP address ranges and what should be the private IP address ranges and I'm not going to go into much more detail there is still a lot which goes behind the background on how public IP addresses get routable on the internet in AWS but that's more from a networking specialist perspective so this is just for you to get an idea on what is an IP address what is a private and public IP address what needs to what is the core requirement in order to ensure that a device can communicate with the internet and just for you to understand packets when it comes to source and destination these all concepts are very important when you go learning forward into more aspects for AWS so this marks the first part in understanding this entire networking concepts in AWS hi and welcome back now in this chapter I want to discuss a little bit about CIDR blocks 
So when you work with VPCs, with subnets, with security groups, we're going to see a lot of this CI DR blocks. So we're just going to discuss the basics about a CI DR block. Now, what's the basic concept or why do we have a CI DR block? This basically gives the definition for the network, something known as the network ID and the number of hosts in a network. Now, for example, this server, this EC2 instance is getting a private IP. From where is it getting this number? It's getting this number based on what is the CIDR block assigned to the subnet. Remember, the subnet is the home for the EC2 instance. So depending upon what is the definition of the CIDR block, you would get the IP address of the underlying EC2 instance. Now let's take a very simple example of this CIDR block. Now what does the slash 24 mean? The slash 24 means that this is the network mask. What exactly is the network mask or something known as the network ID? For that, let's understand very quickly the private or an IP address. Now you can read this IP address. This is something in human readable form. But when it comes to the underlying network card or the underlying server, it understands everything in bits and bytes. So actually the IP address is nothing but a collection of bits but for you to understand it properly in a human readable format it has been given or it has been decided to basically give numbers for these underlying bits so each dot basically represent a division of the number of bits or basically a byte remember one byte is eight bits of information. And what is a bit? A bit is nothing but zero or one. Very basic, we're going to very basic. So if you look at the first number, 10, it's actually represented by eight bits. So if you convert this to bits, you get zero, zero, you basically get this representation in bits. Similarly, all of these have 888 bits. And this is nothing but a 32-bit IP address. This is also known as IPv4. So this is a 32-bit address that is assigned to your NIC card, just to make it in a human readable format, you will see it has this number. So we come back. So I said that slash 24 means that this will be the network mask. So to make it very simple, Again, you create eight bits. Now, since this is slash 24, so it means that eight plus eight plus eight, that's 24 bits are marked as one or turned on. That means this represents 10, this represents zero, and this represents one. This becomes your network ID. So this part of the IP address is your network ID. And this last part is known as the host ID. 
So if you have another server in the same subnet, it will have the same network ID, but a different host ID. So in the end, what I'm actually coming to is that this CIDR block will tell you what is the network ID for that particular subnet and what is the number of hosts you can have in that subnet and how do you calculate the host since this is slash 24 remember this is a 32 bit address range so the next set of eight numbers are marked as zero that means this can be either 0, 1, 0, 1. So these are what can be assigned to the hosts or your devices in the network. And if you convert this again to numbers, this is how it is. And if you add all of this up, you get 254. So this means that you can have 254 hosts in a particular subnet starting from 10.0.1 which is your network ID starting again from 0 to 10.0.1.254 so this is your network so this is your host ids which can be assigned to your ec2 instances now aws automatically assigns the private ip based on the cidr block it will just pick an ip address and assign it you don't need to do it yourself if you want you can but i said this is done automatically for you and just a quick note on the side out of this block so this is the traditional way the block is assigned out of this five ip address ranges are reserved this is reserved by aws for routing purposes now i hope this kind of makes it a little bit more clear on what is a cidr block now this entire concept can actually go into hours and hours of talking but i try to make it as simple as possible just for you to get an idea on what is a CIDR block, what is a network mask, what exactly or how do you get IP addresses for the EC2 instances in your VPC. So this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, I just want to explain a very simple concept known as routing. So routing is nothing but how does traffic or how does a request get routed from a source to a destination. For example, let's say you have two virtual servers, your EC2 instances in a VPC and they're part of a subnet. Let's say this server wants to send a request onto this server. So they will use the private IP addresses as a source and destination. But how does the request get routed? There has to be someone that takes the information or the packet from here and sends it to this server. This is done by something known as a router. So in your VPC, there's something of an invisible router, which is used for routing the information. And by routing just means directing the traffic in a particular direction. So what this router will do is that it will get the request from the server. It will see what is the destination IP address and then automatically route the information based on the destination IP address. Just trying to make this as simple as possible. Now, even at home, when you have your own laptop and let's say you are connecting to your Cisco or your D-Link or whatever router you have for the internet. So in the end, that device 
is actually routing whatever you want to get from the internet. The same way you have the router for the VPC that is used for routing all the traffic within all the subnets in a VPC. Similarly, we will learn this a little bit later on. If you want a VPC to connect to the internet, it is assigned a special device known as an internet gateway. So when traffic needs to go to the internet from your VPC, the router will again see what is the destination IP address. For example, let's say you ping the IP address which is on the internet. This is the IP address. It doesn't belong to any of these IP address ranges. So the router knows this has to go to the internet. So what the router will do, let's say this is the server which needs to go to this IP address. It will take the request. The request will go to the router and instead of routing the information internally, it will route the information via the internet gateway. The request will go on the internet. When the response comes back, it will go back to the router and the router will forward it back to the server. The router does everything that's necessary to ensure that when you send something, it is responsible for getting the response back. So this is the main aim of a router. I just want to explain the invisible router that's available in the VPC. You will never see this. The only thing which allows you to control how this router behaves is something known as a route table. So the route table basically defines that if you're going to a particular destination, where should it go to? So for example, if you are just routing information internally, you route it through something known as local. So this is the logical name given to this invisible router. Or if you have to go to the internet gateway, then you specify the internet gateway ID. So this chapter was just to explain the basics of routing in AWS. Hi and welcome to the second part in understanding the virtual private cloud and your elastic compute cloud service. So now we're going to dwell a little bit deeper into the virtual private cloud. Now when you define a virtual private cloud or a VPC, you also have to define something known as a subnet. Now for those who are not familiar with networking, I, I said think of the VPC as a home for your virtual servers. And within that particular home, you again have a logical grouping of networks. These are like child networks as part of the main parent network known as subnets. Now the main parent network, your virtual private cloud, has something known as a CIDR block. Now what is this CIDR block in layman terms? It basically allows the virtual servers to get something known as an IP address. This IP address is like giving it an address for your virtual server. So if you have another virtual server or an EC2 instance, which needs to communicate with this one, how would it do it? It would do it via the IP address. So it's like this virtual server is trying to understand how do I come here? How do I communicate with this EC2 instance? Well, it will take the private IP address of this virtual server, which in this case, I was given an example as 10.0.2.10. How does it get this IP address? This IP address is actually coming from the CIDR block or the IP address range of the subnet and how is a subnet getting this CIDR block? We've actually assigned it, but this CIDR block is a subset of the main CIDR block of the VPC. So in short, 
the CIDR block tells you what is the range of IP addresses that can be assigned to your EC2 instances in your virtual private cloud. Now an EC2 instance needs to be mapped to a subnet. This is very, very important. So a subnet, I said, is your child network within your main VPC network. Now there could be many reasons why you have a subnet or why do you divide your network into many logical networks? Because in a VPC, you don't need to have two subnets. You can just have one subnet, host your virtual server, host your application. But sometimes there is a division or subnets because you could have, let's say, a three tier architecture wherein you have one virtual server for your web application and you could have another server for your database. Now, in order to logically separate them because you should not be having your web server and your database server in the same location or in the same subnet, you could have two different subnets. So you could have one subnet for your web application and another subnet for your database application. So as we move along, as I said, throughout this entire course, till the very end when we're actually looking at design patterns, looking at how to design your applications, all of this will just fit in place. If you're new to networking, if you're new to architecture, yes, this might kind of be a little bit too much, but I said I'm going step by step and making you understand in the best way possible on what is the next category which I'm trying to explain and that is the subnet and the CIDR block. Right, so that marks the end of this part in which we've deep dive into the subnet and the VPC. Hi and welcome back. Now in this video, I want to talk about the next important concept and that is AZ or availability zones. Now an availability zone is basically a grouping of either one or multiple data centers. So over here, I'm showing you just a simple diagram of two data centers. So what exactly again is a data center? This is the building which AWS is using to host its physical servers. And on this physical servers, we are actually hosting our AWS resources. Now also just a quick note, I'm making use of these icons in my diagrams because you as an architect have to be familiar also at some point in time when you're making architecture diagrams to actually make use of these icons. So to make it simpler for you, I'm explaining all of this using these icons in my whiteboard presentations. Right, so let's go back. So we have our data centers. I said an availability zone is basically mapped to one or multiple data centers. Now within a particular region, so I told you in an earlier chapter that when you create a VPC, it's mapped to a particular region. So let's say we have created our VPC in the EU region. Now each region, as I mentioned, is a collection of multiple availability zones. So let's just imagine that this region has two availability zones and each availability zone has separate data centers. So there is again kind of a physical division between these availability zones. Now why do we have availability zones in the first place? So let's look our so let's look at our previous architecture diagram in which we had a VPC, we had two subnets and we had our servers in each of the subnets. Now when you create a subnet, you have to logically map it to an availability zone. Now you could have a subnet mapped to the same availability zone. So you could have this subnet mapped to this availability zone or you could have 
this subnet map to another availability zone and this is a good architecture practice. Why? Let's say for whatever reason this data center goes offline because things can happen. So there could be a power outage, there could be loss in network connectivity. This data center could go down. That means this availability zone is down and that means that this EC2 instance will also not be reachable. Note that it's not going to be terminated or lost forever, but for a brief moment of time, since this data center is down, AWS must be working to make it up. But in the meantime, your EC2 instance is down. But since you have another subnet, since you have the EC2 instance in that subnet, this would still be available because this data center would still be up and running. That's why a region has multiple availability zones and allows you as the architect to architect or design your application in such a way to spread your resources across multiple availability zones. At this point in time, I also want to let you know if there is something known as a disaster wherein the entire region goes down, then you have to make arrangements. There are ways in which you can actually port this entire architecture onto another region. So I hope things are falling in place. We've talked about the VPC, the subnet, the EC2 instance, and your availability zone. So this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, we are actually going to discuss the different elements or components of the VPC. This is important for you to understand when you want to actually communicate with your virtual server from let's say your workstation. So let's say you're working on your workstation. You want to log in to the virtual server. You want to maybe install some application, install a web server. You basically want to do something on that virtual server. Now as an architect, you have to understand the different components of the VPC and how they work. Because remember, this is your own virtual private network on the AWS cloud. Now I've got a lot of stuff going on here. I've put a lot of components. So let's look at all of them in much more detail. So we have our VPC. To make things simple, I just have a single subnet. Again, the CIDR block is a subset of the main CIDR block of the VPC. I have an EC2 instance. Now, in order for your EC2 instance to have the ability to communicate with your workstation via the internet, there are some things which have to be in place. The first main thing is your internet gateway. So the internet gateway is another resource that's available in AWS. It's an appliance which you attach to your VPC. So all communication from now, the EC2 instance will go to the internet gateway and then to your workstation. So this gateway is nothing but an appliance in AWS that is attached to the VPC and is attached to the internet. This is a highly available and durable device that allows you to connect to the internet. So this is the first prerequisite. You need to have the internet gateway in place. Now we come to the second requirement. That is having a public IP for the EC2 instance. Now earlier on, I had mentioned that when you launch an EC2 instance, it will have a private IP. That private IP, I'll discuss in another chapter, is used for internal communication within the VPC itself. 
So if you had another EC2 instance, they would communicate via the private IP. But if you need communication on the internet, you need to have something known as a public routable IP address. This public routable IP address will be attached to the EC2 instance and using the public IP, you can then connect to the EC2 instance from your workstation. So from your workstation, if you want to connect to EC2, use the public IP. That's the second thing done. Now, the third important thing is the route table. Now, each VPC and subnet has something known as a route table attached to it. And a route table basically is nothing but a table which has routing information. I have actually given an example over here. So if I go to my route table, all right, I've got two routes defined. So the first one and the second one. Now in the first one, I have a destination of 10.0 dot zero dot zero slash 16. This is nothing but the CIDR block of the VPC. Now, if you create your own VPC, by default, a route table will be created. That's called the main route table. And in that main route table, you will have one default route, which is this one which says route for anything within the VPC should go to a target known as local. Local means that the VPC has something of its own router. So there's a router attached to the VPC, which handles all the communication within the VPC itself. So if traffic is flowing from this instance, let's say another instance in the same VPC has per the route table, if it's going to an IP address within this range, then the target is the local router. So the router will manage all the communication within that VPC itself. If you want to manage the communication via the internet gateway, then you have to attach another route. What does that route specify? It's a special IP address block range known as 0.0.0.0 slash .0, 0. This means that any traffic which is going from the VPC to the internet has the destination, then the target is the internet gateway ID. So when you create the internet gateway, it will get an ID, a number basically, and you put that in the route table. So this is something you have to explicitly mention in the route table. Once you do this, then the traffic will start flowing to the internet. So these are the important aspects when it comes to your VPC, in our demo, when we actually create our own custom VPC, we are going to be looking at all of these components. Now, at this point in time, I want to explain to you that in your AWS account, when you create your account, a default VPC will be created in every region. And for each default VPC, you will get a default subnet for each availability zone in that region. Why is this the case? It's because it allows you to quickly provision a virtual server in the default VPC. If you were a new user, like you just started using AWS, imagine the amount of artifacts that you have to create 
in order to get started. But what AWS does for you, it creates something known as a default VPC, which I will show you in a video. In that default VPC, everything is already set up. There is already an internet gateway. There is already a route table. There is already a subnet, a VPC, everything is in place. All you have to do is spin up a virtual server or an EC2 instance in that default subnet. And by doing that, you can automatically reach the internet. So we have a video in which I'm going to show you the default VPC. And when we create our EC2 instance, it's also, remember, created in the default VPC. So that's it for this chapter, where we've looked into detail into how the VPC works. Hi, and welcome back. Now, in this chapter, we are going to look at the default VPC. So when you create an AWS account, by default, a virtual private cloud network will be created for you in each region of your account. So let's say if you're working in the Frankfurt region, so the Frankfurt region has a code of EU Central 1. Here you will find a default VPC which has a CIDR block of 172.31.0.0 slash 16. In this VPC, you will get three subnets. There is one subnet for each availability zone and each subnet also has a CIDR block. This default VPC also has an internet gateway. So this is an appliance which is attached to the VPC which allows you to connect to the internet from the VPC itself. So if you have a virtual server that is hosted in the VPC, this virtual server can connect to the internet via the internet gateway appliance. Now apart from that, you also get default security groups, network access control lists and a route table. We're going to go through all of this in subsequent chapters. But now let's go to the AWS console. I just want to show you the default VPC. So here I am in the AWS console. Now currently I am in the Frankfurt region. So these are where you can see all the regions which are associated with your AWS account. Now I am in the Frankfurt region. And in the Frankfurt region, let me now go on to network and content delivery and go on to VPC, our virtual private cloud. Now, by default, if you go on to the VPC section, you will see one default VPC already created for you. This has a CIDR block. And if you go on to the subnets, you will get three subnets. And these subnets are all mapped to the different availability zones. Each of these subnets is mapped to an availability zone. So we have three availability zones in the Frankfurt region, and that's why you have three subnets in this VPC. Apart from that, I said you also get an internet gateway. So this is a separate resource or an appliance, which allows communication from the resources in your VPC to the internet. Apart from that, you get a route table. So the route table basically decides on how the routing works in the VPC itself. We will cover this in subsequent chapters. And then apart from that, you also get network ACLs or access control lists. So this is used to basically control the flow of traffic into the subnets or into your VPC. And then you get a, and then you get a default security group which basically decides on what is the traffic that can flow into the virtual servers hosted in your VPC. Now, if I go from the Frankfurt region to let's say the Ohio region, right? So this is the default VPC that I have in the Ohio region. If I go on to the subnets, 
you can again see that we have three subnets but this time they are mapped to different availability zones and these availability zones are basically part of the Ohio region. So you can see that in each region that you go into you will get a default VPC along with the default subnets. You will also get the other artifacts such as the internet gateway, the route tables, the security groups and the network access control list. And the entire idea behind the default VPC is to allow you to quickly start spinning up virtual servers on the AWS cloud. You don't, you don't need to do the hard work of creating the VPC. If you are just testing how virtual servers work, this is the perfect place. When you start going into more advanced techniques when it comes to AWS and you start building your own environments, then you start creating your own custom VPCs. For now, this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. So now we've looked at the virtual private cloud. We've looked at subnets. Now let's have a look at EC2. And after this, we're going to jump into our demo. So we're going to build our first EC2 instance. Now when you build an EC2 instance, there is a lot going on. So there are a lot of aspects that you have to specify when you create your EC2 instance. I'm going to briefly go through each one of them. Then we're going to our demo just to show you or let's start working with EC2. And then after that, we're actually going to go on and go through each one of these in further depth because it is important to understand this from an associate perspective. So from EC2, this is our virtual server on the cloud. So let's say if you wanted to host a virtual server, let's say it's a Windows server or it's a Red Hat server, what would you normally do? So we would first either buy physical hardware, then install or host virtual machines on top of this physical hardware. But in AWS, in a matter of steps using a wizard, you will get a virtual server on the cloud within a couple of minutes. It's so simple. So let's go through the several aspects which you have to understand when you're creating a virtual server. So the first thing in EC2 is the AMI. This is known as the Amazon machine image. When you specify an AMI, you are actually specifying what is the underlying operating system that you want. Do you want an Ubuntu server? Do you want Red Hat? Do you want Amazon Linux? Or do you want Windows Server? So this is where you choose what is the template you want to use to create your EC2 instance. Next, we also have to choose the instance type. Now, when you choose the instance type, you are actually choosing the amount of CPU, the amount of memory that's going to be assigned to your EC2 instance. This is obviously a big factor on your cost. So if you're choosing an instance type, which has obviously a higher number of CPUs and a high amount of memory, then you would obviously be paying more. Next, you have the volumes. So volumes is the underlying disks which are used to store your data. So you can spare, so you can specify the volumes and the size of the volumes at this particular point in time. Please note that you can also increase the size of an existing volume at any point in time. Next, we have tags. So tags are used as metadata for your instance. So let's say you want to tell someone that this EC2 instance or virtual server which you are provisioning is part of your production environment. You can add a tag saying that environment is equal to production for this EC2 instance. You will see the value of adding tags in subsequent chapters. We then have security groups. Security groups is very important. This is used to control the flow of traffic 
into your EC2 instance. Now, I've given a lot of exams in the AWS. So I've given all the associate level exams and even the security specialist and the networking specialist. And in all of these exams, I see one common pattern. I see that security is a very big aspect in all of these exams. So always focus on security because even in the real world, security is very important. And AWS does their best to ensure that they have as many security controls as possible and give it in our care so that we can be more responsible about how we host applications in AWS. Now, finally, we have our private key. So the private key is used to log into your EC2 instance, right? So these are all the aspects which you should consider when you're creating your first EC2 instance. So as I said, in the next chapter, we're going to go into a demo because it's high time we start working on the AWS resources. And then after this, as I mentioned, we will go step by step and understand all of these concepts in more detail. So this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. So now we're going to go ahead and create an EC2 instance in this particular video. So now the first important thing is for you to ensure that you are in the region of your choice. So remember that if you are creating, let's say an EC2 instance, which we are going to be doing in the Frankfurt region, that EC2 instance will not be available in other regions. It will only be available in the EU Frankfurt region. So always ensure that you have first selected your region and then go ahead and create the EC2 instance. Now to go ahead to the EC2 dashboard, right? So this is your main dashboard where you can see all of the services which are offered by AWS. In order to start working with EC2, go on to the compute section and click on EC2. Over here, you will be directed to the EC2 dashboard. Now there are a lot of aspects which are present in the dashboard and we will be going through the main ones from the perspective of this exam. Now you could directly launch an instance from here or you could go to the running instances. So here you will see all the running instances which are present in the dashboard. So I currently only have one instance which is in the terminated status. So this instance is no longer being used. If you want to go ahead and launch a new instance, click on launch instance. Now there are aspects when you go ahead and create an instance and we'll be going through all of these aspects individually. So first is to choose the AMI type. So this is basically what is the underlying operating system for your EC2 instance. So you could choose images such as Amazon Linux, Red Hat Enterprise, Ubuntu Server or even the Microsoft Windows Server Edition. So here you would make a decision on what is the AMI you want. For the purpose of this demo, let's choose Ubuntu Server. Next, we need to decide what is the instance type. So the instance type will decide how much of CPUs, memory are assigned to your instance. And there are other features as well. So for example, if you go lower down, you can see that when it comes to optimizing your EBS volumes, this feature is available on a certain set of instances. Also, when you have your network performance, you can see the network performance. You can see the network performance increasing as we go down. So there are some instance types which also give you better network performance. Over here, you can actually filter down on the different types of instances which are available. Based on your workload, you would choose the instance type accordingly. So for the purpose of our demo, let's keep the type as t2.micro which has one CPU and one gig of memory. Let's go on to next to configure the instance details. Now here you need to decide in which VPC your instance will be launched. At the moment since we only have a default VPC 
in this particular region. We are going to use that default BPC. For the subnet, we will just say that we don't have a preference. Let AWS decide which is the best subnet to host our instance. Now, as you go along, as you architect your application, as you become better with working with AWS, then you will start deciding where you want to actually place your instances in AWS. Note that you also have the option of creating more than one instance over here. At the moment, we will not go into IAM roles or the shutdown behavior. Let's leave everything as it is. If you go on to advanced details, you also have the option of pasting some text. So these are script files which will run when your instance is booted for the first time. This is good if you want to have some configuration scripts which need to run for the first time. So when your instance is launched, maybe you want to install a software automatically. Maybe you have some security scripts which need to be run on the instance. All of this can be put in the user data. Now let's go on to next to add storage. Now by default, you get a root volume which is attached to your EC2 instance. Now we will be going through volumes and volume types in a subsequent chapter. For now, I just try to understand that these are volumes where you actually store your data, which is attached to the EC2 instance. I said currently you have the root volume, but you can also add additional volumes to your EC2 instance. At this moment in time, I just wanted to make a couple of notes. First thing for the root volume, you only have the options of general purpose SSD, provision IOPS and magnetic. But when you go and create a new volume, you have a couple of more options available to you. Just to make a note. Next, you can also change the size. So how much size do you want for your volume? Please note that at any point in time, you can actually change the size of the volume even after it is created. Now, if you want to make sure that when you terminate the EC2 instance, the EBS volume also gets terminated, then you can put this flag of delete on termination. Because remember, EC2 is a separate resource. The EBS volume is a separate resource. So you get charged for both. So even if you terminate the EC2 instance, but you don't delete the volume, you will be charged for the volume. So if you don't want to retain the volume, make sure this is checked. In case if you do want to retain the volume for any reason. So one of the reasons which I can think about is maybe your EC2 instance is compromised and you want to do some sort of analysis on the volume, then you don't delete the volume and you keep it and maybe you attach it to another instance because you can actually detach volumes from one instance and attach it to another instance at any point in time. Also remember that at this point in time, you can also encrypt your volumes. So by encryption, I mean that all the data which is stored on the volume will be encrypted. Now all of this will be done in the background. You will not see this encryption process happening. When you retrieve the data, the data will be decrypted for you and given to you. But when it's stored on the underlying physical server in the AWS data center, that's the time when it will actually be encrypted. One important point to again note is that you can only enable encryption during the volume creation time. After the volume is created, you cannot enable encryption. You then have to use some operating system level tools to encrypt your data. Now for this moment in time, I'm not going to add another volume because I want to go through volumes I said in a subsequent section. And in that section, I'm going to show you how to add volumes to an EC2 instance. So for the moment, let's leave this volume as it is. Let's go on to next to add tags. So tags are something like metadata that's used to describe your instance. Now tags are very useful. Uh, for example, from a security purpose, you could add tags saying that, you know, this instance belongs to a production environment and no one should have the authority to shut down this instance. So you can define the sort of policy or security policy based on the value of the tag. So 
let's say I want to define a key. I'll define it as environment and I can put a value of production. So over here, I'm saying that please add a tag to this instance. It's a simple key value pair. We can then define, I said, security policies based on this key value pair, saying that if any key equals environment and for that environment, if it has a value of production, then no user should have the authority to shut down or terminate the instance. So this is one of the you know, use cases of tags. Tags are also very important and useful when it comes to billing. We will go through tags in a subsequent chapter. Next is our security group. So our security group is used to control the traffic which flows into our instance. Now for the moment, let's create a new security group. So let me call this as web server. So we'll be having again one dedicated chapter just for security groups because this is important from a solutions architect exam perspective. I'm going to leave the default rule as it is. So this rule basically allows me to log into the instance via the secure shell. I'm going to go ahead and do a review and launch. So you can go ahead and review all the settings and then finally click on launch. Now over here, I'm presented with a screen of saying that I don't have a key pair. So what exactly is a key pair? A key pair is used to actually log into your instance at a later point in time. This is one of the security measures which is in place by AWS to ensure that you can securely log into your EC2 instance. Now currently I don't have an EC2 key pair in my region. So I'm going to say create a new key pair. Let me give a name. Let me download the key pair. After the download is complete, you store the key in a secure location because this key will be used to log into your instance. Now I'm going to go ahead and launch the instance because all of the steps are done. I'll go on to view instances. So now currently my instance is in the pending state. So the instance is now being provisioned by AWS. So we've seen there's a lot of steps which actually go into creating an EC2 instance. And we are going to go into the different aspects of what we've actually seen in the screens because it is important from understanding, you know, what exactly goes behind creating an EC2 instance. Now, some of the other things which is important to understand, at least from this perspective, you can see that the state has already changed. It's now in the running state. You can see how quickly the server has been provisioned on AWS. Again, coming back. So you can see that the instance receives something known as a public DNS name and a public IP. So this can be used to actually log into your EC2 instance. The EC2 instance also gets something known as a private DNS name and a private IP. So this is used for internal communication between your EC2 instances, right? So we've done quite a lot. We've created our first EC2 instance. And if you are new to this, I know it will seem like a lot of steps, but once you start getting used to it, it just becomes like bread and butter. It will become easy for you to start creating your EC2 instance. So this marks the end of this chapter. Let's move on to the next chapter in this course. Hi, and welcome back. Now in this chapter, we are going to go through key pairs. Now a key pair is a combination of a public and a private key. Now key pairs are used as a secure way to log into your EC2 instance. Now in order to actually work with your EC2 instance with a key pair, you need to have a public and a private key. So when you create your EC2 instance, you have the ability to create the key pair along with the EC2 instance itself. Now in the key pair, the public key is actually stored on the server itself. And then you use the private key to log into the server. Now because the private key matches the public key, you can only use that private key to log into the instance. You cannot use another private key. That private key will be matched against the public key and then the connection will be established. So if you use the wrong private key to log into an EC2 instance, 
it will not allow you. So when you generate the key pair in AWS, it's generate has a .pem file. You then use PuttyGen, it's a tool to pull out the private key from the file. Because by default, the public key will already get stored on the server itself. You need to pull out the private key from this .pem file in order to log into the EC2 instance. Once you actually use PuttyGen, you'll get something known as a .ppk file and that's the file you will use to log into the server. A very key note, do not lose your private key file or even the .pem file because the private key file is used to log into your instance. If you lose both the private key file and the .pem file, you will have an issue logging into your instance. Now, I quickly just want to go to the AWS documentation. I just want to show you another aspect when it comes to logging into your instance. So here we are in the AWS documentation. Now, the other aspect I want to show you is the user ID when you actually log into your EC2 instance. So when we created our EC2 instance, we logged in as the username of Ubuntu. So we obviously used our private key, but you also have to enter what will be the user ID to complete the login process into your Linux based instance. So let's say you are creating a instance out of a Debian AMI, then the username should either be admin or root. So in addition to the private key file, also ensure that you specify the right username. So this marks the end of this chapter on the private key file. Hi and welcome back. So now in this chapter, we are going to look at how to connect to our EC2 instance. So in the earlier chapter, we had spun up a new EC2 instance or a virtual server on the cloud. It's now time to connect to that instance. Now in order to connect to that instance, we have to do a couple of prerequisite steps. So the first is to make use of that key pair which we generated when we created our EC2 instance. So remember that we downloaded that key pair, but now it's time to ensure that we generate the private key from this key pair. That private key will then be used to log into our Ubuntu virtual server. Let's, so let's go ahead and use the putty key generator tool. Now, if you don't have this tool available, I will add the link for the download of this tool and the other tool known as Putty, which will be used to log into our instance. So I will add the download link as a resource to this chapter. It's a very simple procedure to go ahead and download the tool and install it. Once you've installed it and you've started the Putty key generator tool, the first thing to do is to load your key pair file. So once you load the file, it will say, okay, it's successfully imported the foreign key. Click on okay. So this is basically your public key. Now you need to go ahead and save the private key. It will say, are you sure you want to save this key without a paraphrase? I will click on yes. Now then go ahead and save this private key. Remember this private key will be used to log into your Ubuntu instance. So I'm going to go ahead and save the EC2 private key in a secure location. Now once this is done, if you go back to our EC2 dashboard, so you can see that not only is our EC2 instance in the running state, also all the status checks are complete. So what AWS will do in the background, it will do some sort of status checks on your instance just to make sure everything is working, the instance is healthy and that you can start using it. In case if there are any issues, then you need to look at the status checks over here and see what's the reason. So you could have a system error or you could have an instance error. Based on that, you might need to either contact AWS or maybe just simply restart your instance. So now over here, I have the putty tool, which is used to connect from Windows to a Linux based instance. So now first thing we need to go on to SSH go to authentication and now browse for the private key file which we just created. Right, so I've got the private key file. Now let me go on to session. Now here we need to add the host name.
Now from the EC2 dashboard, you could either take the public DNS name or you could take the public IP. So let's take the public DNS name. I've copied it. Let's go over to host name and let's click on open. So now you can just accept the host key, click on yes. Now since you've chosen the Ubuntu server AMI, the login ID is Ubuntu. Now I will again add another link as a resource to this chapter which tells you what is the username you should use in case if you are choosing another type of AMI. So for example, let's say you're choosing a Red Hat AMI, the username will be different. It won't be Ubuntu. Because I've chosen an Ubuntu AMI, that's why the user ID is Ubuntu. Right, so we've actually gone ahead and now connected to our instance and now you can use this as a virtual server so now you can go ahead and use this virtual server as you desire. You can download a web server, you can install an application, you can do whatever you want on this virtual machine. Right, so in this chapter we have seen how to connect to our EC2 instance. This marks the end of this chapter. Let's move on to the next chapter in this course. Hi and welcome back. So in the prior chapter we had actually gone ahead and created our EC2 instance. Let's look at what we can actually do with our EC2 instance. So currently it's in the running state. If you go on to actions, there is a whole list of things that you can do with your EC2 instance. For example, if you don't want the instance to be running, you can stop the instance at any point in time. So if you want to cut down on costs, if you don't need the instance running 24 by 7, then you can stop the instance and then start it whenever you want to start using it. If there is any time and issue with the instance itself, you can reboot the instance and very important, when you don't need the instance at all, to ensure that you cut on costs, you can terminate your instance at any point in time. If you go on to instance settings, some of the important points are Replacing an IAM role or attaching an IAM role, we're actually going to see this in detail in a subsequent chapter. If you go on to the system log, you will actually see the log when the instance is booted up. So this is like the boot diagnostics for the instance itself. If we go back to actions in instance settings, if you get the instance screenshot, so you can see that it's waiting for the login. And then you have options for networking and CloudWatch monitoring. Now, a lot of these settings are very useful to understand when you're actually doing the SysOps admin exam. From a solution architect perspective, there are just a few things we need to look into. And we are going to look into this in subsequent chapters wherever they are applicable. But just to make you understand that there are operations that you can perform on your EC2 instance, I want to show this. So this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. So now we're going to go ahead and create an EC2 instance in this particular video. So now the first important thing is for you to ensure that you are in the region of your choice. So remember that if you are creating, let's say an EC2 instance, which we are going to be doing in the Frankfurt region, that EC2 instance will not be available in other regions. It will only be available in the EU Frankfurt region. So always ensure that you have first selected your region and then go ahead and create the EC2 instance. Now to go ahead to the EC2 dashboard, right? So this is your main dashboard where you can see all of the services which are offered by AWS. In order to start working with EC2, go on to the compute section and click on EC2. Over here, you will be directed to the EC2 dashboard. Now there are a lot of aspects which are present in the dashboard and we will be going through the main ones from the perspective of this exam. Now you could directly launch an instance from here or you could go to 
the running instances. So here you will see all the running instances which are present in the dashboard. So I currently only have one instance which is in the terminated status. So this instance is no longer being used. If you want to go ahead and launch a new instance, click on launch instance. Now there are aspects when you go ahead and create an instance and we'll be going through all of these aspects individually. So first is to choose the AMI type. So this is basically what is the underlying operating system for your EC2 instance. So you could choose images such as Amazon Linux, Red Hat Enterprise, Ubuntu Server, or even the Microsoft Windows Server Edition. So here you would make a decision on what is the AMI you want. For the purpose of this demo, let's choose Ubuntu Server. Next, we need to decide what is the instance type. So the instance type will decide how much of CPUs, memory are assigned to your instance and there are other features as well. So for example, if you go lower down, you can see that when it comes to optimizing your EBS volumes, this feature is available on a certain set of instances. Also, when you have your network performance, you can see the network performance. You can see the network performance increasing as we go down. So there are some instance types which also give you better network performance. Over here, you can actually filter down on the different types of instances which are available. Based on your workload, you would choose the instance type accordingly. So for the purpose of our demo, let's keep the type as t2.micro, which has one CPU and one gig of memory. Let's go on to next to configure the instance details. Now here, you need to decide in which VPC your instance will be launched. At the moment, since we only have a default VPC in this particular region, we are going to use that default VPC. For the subnet, we will just say that we don't have a preference. Let AWS decide which is the best subnet to host our instance. Now, as you go along, as you architect your application, as you become better with working with AWS, then you will start deciding where you want to actually place your instances in AWS. Note that you also have the option of creating more than one instance over here. At the moment, we will not go into IAM roles or the shutdown behavior. Let's leave everything as it is. If you go on to advanced details, you also have the option of pasting some text. So these are script files which will run when your instance is booted for the first time. This is good if you want to have some configuration scripts which need to run for the first time. So when your instance is launched, maybe you want to install a software automatically. Maybe you have some security scripts which need to be run on the instance. All of this can be put in the user data. Now let's go on to next to add storage. Now by default, you get a root volume which is attached to your EC2 instance. Now we will be going through volumes and volume types in a subsequent chapter. For now, I just try to understand that these are volumes where you actually store your data, which is attached to the EC2 instance. I said currently you have the root volume, but you can also add additional volumes to your EC2 instance. At this moment in time, I just wanted to make a couple of notes. First thing for the root volume, you only have the options of general purpose SSD, provision IOPS and magnetic. But when you go and create a new volume, you have a couple of more options available to you. Just to make a note. Next, you can also change the size. So how much size do you want for your volume? Please note that at any point in time, you can actually change the size of the volume even after it is created. Now, if you want to make sure that when you terminate the EC2 instance, the EBS volume also gets terminated, then you can put this flag of delete on termination. Because remember, EC2 is a separate resource. The EBS volume is a separate resource. So you get charged for both. So even if you terminate the EC2 instance, but you don't delete the volume, you will be charged for the volume. 
So if you don't want to retain the volume, make sure this is checked. In case if you do want to retain the volume for any reason, so one of the reasons which I can think about is maybe your EC2 instance is compromised and you want to do some sort of analysis on the volume, then you don't delete the volume and you keep it and maybe you attach it to another instance because you can actually detach volumes from one instance and attach it to another instance at any point in time. Also remember that at this point in time you can also encrypt your volumes. So by encryption I mean that all the data which is stored on the volume will be encrypted. Now all of this will be done in the background. You will not see this encryption process happening. When you retrieve the data, the data will be decrypted for you and given to you. But when it's stored on the underlying physical server in the AWS data center, that's the time when it will actually be encrypted. One important point to again note is that you can only enable encryption during the volume creation time. After the volume is created, you cannot enable encryption. You then have to use some operating system level tools to encrypt your data. Now for this moment in time, I'm not going to add another volume because I want to go through volumes I said in a subsequent section. And in that section, I'm going to show you how to add volumes to an EC2 instance. So for the moment, let's leave this volume as it is. Let's go on to next to add tags. So tags are something like metadata that's used to describe your instance. Now tags are very useful. Uh, for example, from a security purpose, you could add tags saying that, you know, this instance belongs to a production environment and no one should have the authority to shut down this instance. So you can define the sort of policy or security policy based on the value of the tag. So let's say I want to define a key. I'll define it as environment and I can put a value of production. So over here, I'm saying that please add a tag to this instance. It's a simple key value pair. We can then define, I said, security policies based on this key value pair saying that if any key equals environment and for that environment, if it has a value of production, then no user should have the authority to shut down or terminate the instance. So this is one of the you know, use cases of tags. Tags are also very important and useful when it comes to billing. We will go through tags in a subsequent chapter. Next is our security group. So our security group is used to control the traffic which flows into our instance. Now for the moment, let's create a new security group. So let me call this as web server. So we'll be having again one dedicated chapter just for security groups because this is important from a solutions architect exam perspective. I'm going to leave the default rule as it is. So this rule basically allows me to log into the instance via the secure shell. I'm going to go ahead and do a review and launch. So you can go ahead and review all the settings and then finally click on launch. Now over here, I'm presented with a screen of saying that I don't have a key pair. So what exactly is a key pair? A key pair is used to actually log into your instance at a later point in time. This is one of the security measures which is in place by AWS to ensure that you can securely log into your EC2 instance. Now currently I don't have an EC2 key pair in my region. So I'm going to say create a new key pair. Let me give a name. Let me download the key pair. After the download is complete, you store the key in a secure location because this key will be used to log into your instance. Now I'm going to go ahead and launch the instance because all of the steps are done. I'll go on to view instances. So now currently my instance is in the pending state. So the instance is now being provisioned by AWS. So we've seen there's a lot of steps which actually go into creating an EC2 instance. And we are going to go into the different aspects of what we've actually seen in the screens because it is important from understanding, you know, what exactly goes behind creating an EC2 instance. 
Now, some of the other things which is important to understand, at least from this perspective, you can see that the state has already changed. It's now in the running state. You can see how quickly the server has been provisioned on AWS. Again, coming back, so you can see that the instance receives something known as a public DNS name and a public IP. So this can be used to actually log into your EC2 instance. The EC2 instance also gets something known as a private DNS name and a private IP. So this is used for internal communication between your EC2 instances. Right, so we've done quite a lot. We've created our first EC2 instance. And if you are new to this, I know it will seem like a lot of steps. But once you start getting used to it, it just becomes like bread and butter. It will become easy for you to start creating your EC2 instance. So this marks the end of this chapter. Let's move on to the next chapter in this course. Hi and welcome back to this course on the AWS Solution Architect Associate. So now we're going to understand instance types. So this was an aspect which we chose when we created our EC2 instance. So let's quickly understand what are the different instance types available. So there are different categories available and each category basically gives you certain features for different computing purposes. So first we have general purpose. So the general purpose instance type is good for normal workloads. So if you have a workload which is predictable in nature, then you will use general purpose. If you have something that has or needs a lot of computing power, then you would use the compute optimized. If you need an instance which is very good in terms of the memory, so you need fast memory for that particular instance, then you would choose the memory optimized. If you want faster graphics, if you want more computing at the graphic level, then you could choose the accelerated computing. So for those you know, companies which basically want to host their gaming application servers on AWS, they can make use of this instance type. And then we have the storage optimized, which is good from a storage perspective. Now let's quickly understand an example of these two instance types. So let's say you wanted to host a web server, which has a predictable workload, right? So you know that it's not going to undergo too much of a load uh, you know, from users, then what is the underlying instance type you would choose? You would choose general purpose. Let's say you want to host a database on a server which has a lot of input output operations on it. Then what would you choose? You would choose the compute optimized. If you want to host a caching solution, so let's say you want to install the Redis cache solution. So it's really memory intensive. So what is the type of instance you would choose? You would choose the memory optimized instance type. Let's go to the AWS documentation. I want to show you the different types of instances which are available in AWS. So here we are in the AWS documentation. I will attach this link as a resource to this chapter as well. So in here, you can see the different classification of the instance types which is available in AWS. Now in the general purpose itself, you have different categories available. And for each category, you have the model. It will tell you how many CPUs are available for that particular instance type, the amount of CPU and the amount of memory. Now certain instance types also have certain features certain enhanced features which you may want for your application. For example, let's go on to the memory optimized. So over here, you can see that it also has SSD storage attached to it. This is very important for a memory based application. So if an application needs to make use of local memory storage, then it needs to have SSD which is attached has a cache to the CPU. So for that, this instance type has this additional feature of SSD and also a dedicated bandwidth line to your elastic block storage. So each family of instance type has different features available, which makes it more different and specific for that particular purpose. 
obviously do note that you will obviously pay more if you choose a larger instance type which needs a lot number of CPUs and memory and also with the dedicated features. So you have to choose wisely when you are choosing your instance type. Now normally I just choose the general purpose and normally I go with a t2.small or a t2.medium. Now I currently have my own collaboration site hosted on a t2.medium instance and I find this more than sufficient enough to host my application. You can even start with a t2.small or even a t2.micro to see how it works. In our examples, we are going to be using either the t2.small or the t2.medium. This is just to ensure that the instance is fast enough for us to actually go through the demo. Right, so this is it from what is an instance type. Let's now move on to the next chapter in this course. Now here we are in the AWS console. So I just want to quickly go through the concept of upgrading an instance to a larger instance type. So let's imagine that you have a virtual server. So let's imagine this virtual server which has the name of Ubuntu A. Now currently this instance is part of a particular instance type. So it has a certain number of CPUs and memory assigned to it. Now let's say if you go on to the monitoring section and let's say your CPU utilization is going to a high amount, it's going maybe beyond 70 to 80 percent and you now feel that you need to have a larger instance type to support the workload on this virtual server. Well you can upgrade it to a higher instance type. Obviously you will be paying more but in the end if you need higher capacity for your underlying instance, this is the best way to ensure that you have enough capacity for your workload. Now if you choose your instance, if you go on to actions and if you go on to instance settings, there is an option to change the instance type. But you can see that this has been grayed out. We can't use this option. And why is that? It's because the instance is in a running state. We have to ensure that we first stop the instance and then we would have the ability to change the instance type. So let me pause this video and come back once the instance is in a stop state. So now we are back. The instance is in a stop state. Now if I go back to actions, if I go on to instance settings, now I have the ability to change the instance type. So let's click on it. Here you get the option of upgrading it to a higher instance type. So I'm going to choose a t2.small, click on apply. Now I'm going to go ahead and start the instance. So it was as simple as that. The only caveat is that you have to stop the instance first in order to change the instance type and once you start the instance you will now get a higher capacity for your underlying instance. So this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now I just want to show you in this chapter the elastic network interface. So remember the elastic network interface is your network interface or your virtual network card which is assigned to your virtual server. This is used for sending of information and receiving of information into your EC2 instance. This Elastic Network Interface has the private and the public IP assigned to it. So in order to see your Elastic Network Interface, let's go over to the EC2 dashboard. Now let's go over to our running instances Let's take any instance, Ubuntu A for example. Now if you go down, you can see it has one network interface that is ETH0. If you click on it, you can see the different details about the network interface. So you can see that it has a private and a public IP address. If you go ahead on to the network interfaces section, you can see the interfaces over here as well. Now you can create additional 
network interfaces and then attach it to your EC2 instance. So you can have multiple network interfaces for your EC2 instances. Now from a perspective of a solution architect associate, it is just enough for you to understand that there is a concept known as an elastic network interface that is attached to your EC2 instance. This marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now in the prior chapter, we had looked a lot about the VPC, the internet gateway, the route tables, etc. Now to keep in line on understanding the different aspects when it comes to the VPC and the EC2, let's now talk about security groups. So when we created our EC2 instance, we created a security group and there was one default rule in that security group. So what exactly is a security group? A security group is nothing but a set of rules which allows traffic to flow into your EC2 instance. So now when any request is coming into the EC2 instance, by default, all traffic is denied. So even you can't connect to the EC2 instance if you don't have a rule in your security group. So even if you have the internet gateway in place, you have a public IP and you have the route table all defined. If you don't have a rule in your security group, if there is a request coming into the EC2 instance, the packet will be dropped and the request will be denied. This is how security groups work. This is like a firewall, an outside firewall for your EC2 instance. So in order to allow traffic to come from, let's say your workstation, you have to add something known as a rule, a rule to your security group. A very simple rule over here, it's saying, please allow traffic on port 22. So port 22 is where the SSH protocol works. If this was a Windows based instance and you had to remote desktop to this EC2 instance, then you would allow RDP or port 3389, right? So this is the port number. You mentioned the protocol, whether it's TCP or UDP. And then you mention where is the source? Where is the traffic coming from? So you can mention the IP address of your client workstation. This is a very secure way of defining the rule in your security group. In case when you are beginning to work with EC2 and security groups, it's okay to mention the address range has this CIDR block, which means that allow traffic from anywhere in the internet. That's fine when you're beginning or learning AWS, but when you start building your entire network and application, please ensure that you have strict security rules in place for your EC2 instance. So let's say you had an application hosted on this instance. Let's say the application is a web server listening on port 80. This is how normal web servers work. In order for the outside world to reach your web server, you have to add a rule saying allow traffic on port 80 on the TCP protocol from anywhere on the internet. So you have to add this rule. We're actually going to see a demo on how security groups work. But I say just to keep in line in making sure we understand everything about the EC2 instance, that's why we are going to the concept of security groups. So the main takeaway is security groups is used to control traffic 
into your EC2 instance, it's actually tagged to at this point in time to the EC2 instance just for your understanding. Internally, it's actually tagged to something known as an ENI or the Elastic Network Interface. So there's a network card, a virtual network card you can say, that's attached to your EC2 instance. And the security group is actually associated with that ENI. So this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, we are actually going to have a look at a demo on security groups. Now in the last chapter, we had a look at what are security groups. But again, let's have a quick recap. So let's say you had an EC2 instance or your virtual server on the cloud. You've installed a web server. You want to host an application on that web server. So let's say you're hosting a website which has a DNS name of cloudportalhub.com. And if you want users to access that website on your EC2 instance, by default, let's say everything has as per the defaults in the AWS console, the access will be denied. So no user will be allowed to access the web server on the EC2 instance. And why is this the case? So here I'm showing a snippet or snapshot of a security group. Here the security group has both inbound and outbound rules. So these rules define what is the traffic that's allowed into your EC2 instance. Now by default, when we created our EC2 instance in the earlier chapters, there was a default rule in place. That default rule was meant to allow access to secure shell or connect to the instance. But there is no rule to allow traffic to flow into the EC2 instance onto our web server. That's why the access would be denied. So one very important fact when it comes to an architect's understanding is that by default, all traffic is denied when it comes to security groups. You have to explicitly allow access for traffic. So if you were to allow, let's say a user to access our web server on our EC2 instance, the request normally goes on port 80 because normally you have your web service listening on port 80 on the EC2 instance and the protocol would be TCP. So if you go back to our security groups, this is how it would look like. So if you want to allow users on the internet to access the web server on your EC2 instance, then you have to put these rules in place. Just to let you know that by default, when you actually create this rule, it will create two rules. One is for IPv4 traffic and the other is for IPv6 traffic. Now you don't need to understand the code difference at the moment between IPv6 and IPv4. These are internet protocols. Just for the importance from an architect perspective, understand that in order for users to access something on a custom port range and a protocol, you have to put that as part of the security group. So let's go to the AWS console and let's see how we can get this done. So here we are back. Um, what I've done is that I've gone ahead and logged in to our Ubuntu instance. So this is the instance which we spun up in an earlier chapter. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to install the Apache web server. It's very simple. First, I'll just do a sudo app get update. This is just to ensure that all the recent packages are updated on the system. And once that's done, I'll do an app get install. Apache 2. 
So what it's doing is that now it's actually installing the Apache web server on this Ubuntu machine. Now once this is done, so if I take now the DNS name of the server and if I go on to another tab, now ideally what I should be getting is the home page of our Apache web server. That's because the Apache web server is listening on port 80. So when I put this public DNS name or even the public IP, I should be able to reach the home page for the Apache web server. But you will see that you will not be able to reach the site. And that's because of the security group rules. So let's go back to our EC2 management console. If you want to simply go on to the security groups, what you can do, you can either go to the security groups in the networking and security section for your EC2 dashboard or very easily if you go on to security groups in the description for your EC2 instance, click on the security group and you will directly go to the security group itself. So here you have two tabs, important tabs. So one is the traffic for inbound. So whatever traffic is coming into the EC2 instance, you can control. And whatever is the traffic that's going out of the EC2 instance, this is something you can specify as well. What you can see is that by default, all traffic is allowed to go out of the EC2 instance. But by default, only at the moment, traffic on port 22 is allowed to reach into the EC2 instance. Now you will go more in depth into learning about security groups and inbound and outbound rules when you do the AWS security specialist exam because this is very important. Security is really a core aspect when it comes to managing your IT infrastructure both on your on-premise environment and in the cloud. So you will learn in depth about inbound and outbound rules just for the purpose of this demo since we're just starting out. What we need to do is that we need to allow port 80 into this EC2 instance. So I'm going to click on edit I'm going to leave the rule as it is. Remember to keep this rule in place. Do not change the current rule. Click on add rule to add a new rule. If by mistake you have changed this, you can actually just click on cancel so that the changes are not saved. But in case if you have not made the sort of change, just click on add rule. Here you have all the default types of traffic that you could allow in the EC2 instance. So if your web server is listening on port 443, that is secure shell for HTTPS, you can choose that. But for the purpose of our demo, we are going to choose the port 80 range. I'm going to allow the source from anywhere. So any user on the internet can reach my web server. Once this is done, I'm going to click on save. Now this effect is immediate. So if I go on to the tab and if I just refresh it, I have now got the home page for my Apache web server. So what you've actually done is that you've actually created kind of a rule in the firewall in AWS for the EC2 instance saying that please now allow traffic into the EC2 instance on port 80. So this is how you actually allow traffic to flow into your EC2 instance via security groups. So this marks the end of this demo. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, I want to talk about network access control lists. Now earlier we had seen the concept of security groups, which was used to restrict access into your EC2 instance. Now there is one more level of security control that AWS provides you and that is network access control list. This acts as a firewall for your entire subnet. So the security groups is like a firewall for your instance, but you also have a firewall for your entire subnet and that is done via a network access control list. So this list similar to a security group 
has a set of rules again for inbound and outbound traffic. So here I've given again a very sample, it's almost the same. So you have a rule which mentions the protocol, the port number and the source. Now one of the key differences between the security group and the network access control list is that remember security groups by default denies all traffic whereas the default network access control list which is created for you and attached to the subnet allows all traffic by default. This is very one important point. The second important point comes to stateful and stateless filtering. Now this is a little bit uh, advanced in terms of security groups and network access control lists. So I'm going to discuss this at a later point in time. This is actually more important when you go for advanced certifications for the purpose of an architect. You just have to understand that security groups are mapped to your instances and network access control list is mapped to your entire subnet. Now one very important use or use case scenario which you have to understand from a network access control list. Let's say for the purpose of this example, you have one workstation which has an IP of 52.10.1.1. Let's say your IT security department is telling you that there are a lot of requests coming from this machine. It could be an attack. So it could be that this machine is generating traffic against your EC2 instance or your web server. It's trying to bring maybe your web server down. Now obviously in the real world you won't have only one instance but just for the sake of this example let's just imagine that you have one machine which is generating all the traffic. So the IT security department is saying we have to stop traffic from this instance. So instead of you going to each and every security group and trying to deny access, you have to stop it before it even reaches your VPC or subnet. And the way you do that is by mentioning a rule in the network access control list. So you would mention the protocol, the port and the source number but what is very important is that in network access control list also you mention what is the action whether it's a deny action or an allow. So you can mention for this specific use case deny all traffic from this particular source IP. So as soon as a request comes from this workstation or this machine onto your subnet, the packet will be dropped. The request will be dropped. It will not even come into your subnet. And that's because of this deny rule. So you can use the network access control list to allow and deny traffic into your subnet before it even reaches inside the subnet. So this is security from an outside level for your subnet. Now important, now one important point from an architect perspective. So remember this is security for your entire subnet. So remember whatever you change here will be applicable for all the virtual servers that you're hosting in this subnet. Just remember this from an architect perspective. Right, so this is from an introduction to network access control list. We're also going to see a demo on how we can work with network access control lists. Hi and welcome back. So now in this chapter, we are going to look at a demo on network access control lists. Now the network access control list is something that's attached to your subnet and to your VPC. So one key thing to note is that whatever rules you define in the subnet will affect all the virtual servers which are defined in that subnet. Now by default, a network access control list allows all traffic into your subnet. This is different from a security group 
which is attached to an EC2 instance, which by default denies all traffic into an EC2 instance. So in network access control list, you can actually define rules which could deny certain types of traffic from certain source locations from entering into your subnet. So let's look at an example of this by going on to our AWS console. So here we are in the AWS console. Now if I go on to VPC, I will go on to the VPC management dashboard. Let's go on to our VPC. Let's click on a VPC. And over here you can see that the VPC is associated with a network access control list. Now if you go on to your subnets, if you go on to any subnet, all of these will also be associated with the same network access control list. So let's click on the network access control list. Let's go to it. Let's go to the rules. So you have rules for controlling the inbound traffic into your subnet and rules for controlling the outbound rules into your subnet. Now details about how you define inbound and outbound rules for better security is all part of when you take the exam for the AWS security specialist exam. For the purpose of the AWS solution architect associate, we just need to understand the concept behind network access control list. So now I mentioned that for inbound and outbound rules, by default, all traffic is allowed, which means that if you have any request which is coming into the subnet, into your EC2 instance, it will be allowed by default. Let's take an example. So here I have my EC2 management console open. Now, if I remember correctly, in one of our earlier chapters, we had actually installed one virtual server on our Ubuntu instance. So let's go to Ubuntu B. Let's go to description. Let's go to the public IP. Let's copy it. Let's go over to another tab. So here you can see that we're getting the home page for the Apache web server. If you don't have it in place, you can actually just go ahead and install Apache. So we've done this when we worked with our security groups chapter. So now we can access the home page for our web server on this EC2 instance. Now let's say for a moment that my workstation or laptop is generating malicious traffic onto your web server. So let's say I'm a hacker. I'm trying to bring down your site. I'm trying to flood your EC2 instance or your web server with traffic from my workstation. So let's say your IT security department has told you that a lot of traffic is coming from this one IP address. And they are telling you that we have to block this IP address to ensure that no traffic comes into the subnet. How can we achieve this? So firstly, I said, let's assume that the traffic is coming from my workstation. So first, let me get my IP. So I'll just type in what is my IP in Google. This will give me the IP address which is assigned to my workstation. I'm just going to copy this because I need this when we define the rules in our network access control list. Now I'm going to click on edit and I'm going to add another rule. Now I'm going to add a rule. Let me add a rule number. And let me say that I want to deny all traffic which is coming from my source IP address. I have to add the slash 32 just to indicate that this is a single IP address. You can add a range of IP addresses if you want to. I am saying that I want to deny all traffic which is coming from the source IP address. If you want, you can segregate what is the type of traffic that you either want to allow or deny. 
when you go deeper into security as i mentioned as an aws security specialist you will not have this first rule of allowing all traffic you will actually have more drill down rules to ensure that the right traffic is allowed and denied into your subnet but since as i mentioned that we are just beginning or starting has an aws solution architect associate you just need to understand what is the way in which network access control lists work so i'm going to go ahead and save this so just remember we have one rule which is rule number 100 which is saying allow all traffic and we have one rule which is 101 which is saying deny traffic from my source ip address so now ideally if i go on to this ip address and i click refresh i should be denied access but i still have the ability to go to this web page i should be denied access why am i still having the ability to go to my web server is it because it takes time for the rules to get applied well no when you change a rule it is automatically and immediately applied then why is it that i still have the ability to reach my web server it's because of the evaluation order of this rule numbers the rule numbers are evaluated in order so when the request is coming to my subnet the first rule is being evaluated that's rule number 100 and it is saying please allow all traffic from any source so this is matching my request which is coming from my workstation so it is allowing the request and because it is allowing the request the next rule is not being evaluated and that's because the first rule has already complied with what are the requirements for that request and because this is already complied with the request all other subsequent rules in the table will not be evaluated so how can i ensure that my rule this custom rule is evaluated first well we just change the rule number so we can put a higher rule number for the default traffic let's click on save so now my deny rule will be evaluated first let's go on to apache let's hit on refresh and now you can see that it's going in a loop it's actually now trying to access my web server and after some time you would actually hit a point wherein we will not have the ability to reach the web server so here you can see it is clearly saying the site can't be reached and that's now because we have the deny rule in our network access control list so i hope this gives you a good understanding on how you can use network access control list to either allow or deny traffic into your subnet remember that if you have 3 to 4 or 5 virtual machines defined in that subnet these network access control list will affect all the virtual machines in that subnet and since this network access control list is mapped to multiple subnets it will affect all the subnets in this particular vpc so when you work with network access control list please keep all of this in mind for now this marks the end of this chapter hi and welcome back now in this chapter we are going to go through a demo on how you can establish communication between ec2 instances which are in different subnets in a particular vpc so now earlier on we had created one ubuntu instance in our default vpc so our default vpc which we were referring to is the one in the frankfurt region now each vpc has a name since we are in the frankfurt region the name of the region is eu central 1 this region has three availability zones that are 
named as EU Central 1A, EU Central 1B and EU Central 1C respectfully. Now what we're going to do is that we are going to spin up another Ubuntu instance in another availability zone and then just simply do a ping from each instance to each other. All I want to show you is that you can establish communication between servers in different subnets which are mapped to different availability zones within a VPC. So let's go ahead to the AWS console and see how we can get this done. Now if you want to know what's the name or the code assigned to the different regions, you can always go to the AWS documentation. I will attach a link as a resource to this chapter. So over here you can see that our Frankfurt region is mapped to EU Central 1. And then there are commands which can be used to get what are the availability zones available in that particular region. So if you use this command from the command line interface, we haven't gone through the command line interface as of yet, but just to let you know that you can use the command line interface to get what are the different availability zones within a particular region. But we can already see this via the console. So let me go back to the AWS console. So here I am in the AWS console. So I currently only have my Ubuntu instance which we had launched in an earlier chapter. Now if I open up the VPC management dashboard, so again if you need to understand how to get over here, if you go back to the AWS main dashboard, if you go on to networking and content delivery and you click on VPC, again ensure that you are in the right region. So I am in the Frankfurt region. Now there is one VPC, this is our default VPC and if you click on the subnets, so you will see the three default subnets which are available as part of the VPC and if you scroll to the right, you will see the different availability zones. So you can see that each subnet has been created for each availability zone in that default VPC. Now the first thing I'm going to do is that I can see that this Ubuntu instance is running in our EU Central 1B availability zone. I'm just going to rename this as Ubuntu B just to make sure that we have a naming convention for our EC2 instances. Let's go ahead and launch an instance. So we're going to launch a new Ubuntu instance. I'm going to choose Ubuntu server. I'll keep it as t2.micro. Now over here, I will make sure that we have our default VPC and in the availability zone, I'm going to choose now this time EU Central 1A. So our earlier Ubuntu instance is in EU Central 1B. I am now creating this instance in EU Central 1A. I'm going to leave all the settings as they are. I'll go to next. I will leave the storage as it is in the tags. I will add a name tag. So I will name this as Ubuntu A. I'll go on to next. I will select the same security group which we've assigned to Ubuntu A. I will go to a review and launch. Click on launch. Acknowledge that I have the key pair and click on launch instances. Right, so now let's go on to view our instances and we can see that the new instance is currently in the pending state. So let's come back once the instance is up and running. So now we are back and both of our servers are up and running. Now what I've gone ahead and done is that I've actually connected to both of the servers. So you can see this has an ending IP of 212 and this has an ending IP of 94. If I go back to the console, so 94 is basically the ending private IP, remember, of our Ubuntu A instance. And if we go on to Ubuntu B, the, the 212 is basically the ending private IP of our Ubuntu B instance. So just remember that we are now going to communicate via the private IP of the underlying virtual servers and not the public IP. 
the public IP is used for us to connect to the virtual server from the internet but when it comes to the internal communication of the virtual servers within the private cloud itself they would do it via the private IP so let's go ahead so we are back in our virtual servers let's do a simple ping so let's go to the first server let's do a ping 172.31.27.94 now just to let you know that this command will not work at this point in time so let me just do a ping so it's trying to ping the other server but it's not able to do so so why is this the case this is because of primarily the security groups so the security groups which is attached to the underlying virtual servers are not allowing for the communication to take place so I'm going to cancel from this I'm going to go back to our AWS console now both of our virtual servers are part of this web server security group let's go over to that web server security group let's go over to inbound now in order to ensure that both the servers can ping each other we have to ensure that we add that ping protocol so let's add a rule and in the rule we have to choose the all ICMP protocol so this will ensure that the servers can communicate with each other via the ping protocol now for the IP address what we can do is that we can just simply put the CIDR block of the VPC itself if you are not sure you can go back to the VPC management dashboard go to the VPC here you can see the CIDR block so just copy it go back to the console put it over here and that's it because you just want to allow the communication for the security group within the VPC CIDR block itself let's click on save now that this is done let's go back to our service let's try again the same ping command and now we can see the ping command is working as expected I'm going to cancel out from here let's do the same thing from the other instance as well so let's ping the other private IP so that is this private IP 172.31.46.212 and you can see the ping command is working from here as well so what we have done we have launched virtual servers in different subnets in a VPC we have ensured the security groups is allowing for the communication to take place but I want to explain to you another aspect uh, as to why the communication is taking place we had already seen this in one of our earlier chapters where I had explained it on the whiteboard and that is basically our route tables so if you go back to the VPC management dashboard you can see the VPC is assigned a route table this is a separate resource in AWS so if you click on the route table it will open up another tab so I said this is a separate resource in your VPC management dashboard if you click on the route table you can see the summary it has something known as routes if you go to the route note the first route so this is saying that if there is any communication between the VP itself no matter which subnet it is located in always ensure that the requests are routed via something known as local local is a special router that is assigned for each VPC so this will ensure that if any virtual server sends a request to another virtual server whether it be in the same subnet or in a different subnet but in the same VPC it will go through the local router and automatically be able to receive the request this is how the routing is established when it comes to the local communication of virtual servers in a VPC a very important concept the second one is basically allowing communication to the internet so when we are trying to connect to the virtual server 
using its public IP, that is when the second routing uh, rule comes into place. But again, this chapter was only solely based on how to establish local communication between virtual servers in a VPC. This marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, we will go through VPC flow logs. Now VPC flow logs allows you to capture information on IP traffic which is coming to and from network interfaces in a VPC. Now you can enable VPC flow logs on an individual elastic network interface or on the entire VPC itself or on the entire subnet. All of the flow logs or the log information is then sent on to Amazon CloudWatch logs. Now here is a sample on one of the log events from VPC flow logs. So this is the raw format in which you will see the logs. Let's go through each part and understand what is the information it provides. So first is the version number of the flow logs. Next is the account number. Next is the Elastic Network Interface number. So this is the ENI on which the information was captured. Next you have the source IP address. Next is the destination IP address. Next is the source port number. Then you have the destination port number. You then have the protocol number the number of packets that was transferred during this request, the number of bytes that were transferred, what is the start of the capture window and the end of the capture window in terms of Unix seconds, whether the traffic was accepted or rejected, and finally, what is the log status. So these are the different elements of the log. Now when would you use VPC flow logs? So if you wanted to check what traffic is allowed or rejected, you would use VPC flow logs. So let's say you have put security groups and network access control lists on your subnet and EC2 instance, and the traffic is not reaching your instance and you are not able to decipher as to why. Maybe you, your rules are too restrictive and hence the traffic is not reaching the instance. In such a case, you can use VPC flow logs. You can see the rejections and try to understand at which point the traffic is being rejected. When not to use VPC flow logs, this is if you want detailed packet filtering. So if you want detailed packet filtering and inspection, then use a host intrusion detection system or a firewall. Now I'll just quickly go to the AWS console. I will just show you where you can configure VPC flow logs and then show you the logs which are generated in CloudWatch. So here we are in the VPC dashboard. Now in your VPCs, you can enable flow logs on the VPC level. So you can go on to flow logs. You can create a flow log. So when you create a flow log at a VPC level, it will create a log for each elastic network interface in all the subnets in the VPC. If you want at the subnet level, so you don't want to capture information about all the subnets, then you can go on to the subnets. You can go on to any subnet and then create the flow log for the subnet. So now it will record only the elastic network interfaces in that subnet. Or you can even go to your EC2 dashboard. You can go on to network interface and for any elastic network interface, you can go on to flow logs and you can create a flow log. Now in the subnets, when you create flow log, 
you need to ensure that you specify what is the filter you want. Do you want to record all traffic or just the traffic which is accepted or rejected? Next, you need to create an IAM role. So this IAM role will allow the VPC flow logs to enter into CloudWatch. So when you click on setup permissions, automatically AWS will allow you to create a new role. You just have to click on allow. Now, if you look at the policy document, it says here what are the permissions required. So the permissions are to create a log group, create a log stream, describe the log groups, and also allow you to put log events. So these are the different permissions which is required by VPC flow logs onto CloudWatch logs. Now, once you have created the role, you then need to specify a destination log group. So the name of the log group to which flow logs will be published. Now, I've already gone ahead. I have created a log group. I have created the role and I've created the flow log itself. So now if I go on to CloudWatch, so let me go on to logs. So the logs I have created is VPC flow logs. And over here, you can see that it's recording flow logs for each elastic network interface at that subnet level. Now, if I go on to any elastic network interface, you will see all the raw data. So this is the same data which I showed you in the PowerPoint slides, which gets recorded. Now you probably will have to have another tool to pass this data and give you the information in a dashboard format. So you could use existing AWS tools to pass this data and then give you metrics on how data is actually flowing into the subnet. Now, one important point again, I said is that this is only going to give you information on whether traffic is accepted or rejected and from where the traffic is coming from. It will not do inspection of packets. So this marks the end of this chapter in which we have seen VPC flow logs and the data that can be provided via flow logs. Let's now move on to the next chapter in this course. Hi and welcome back. In this chapter, we are going to look at creating our own custom VPC. So in the earlier chapters, we had seen how to work with our default VPC. Now let's go ahead and create our own custom VPC. So we are going to create a VPC from scratch in this chapter. We're going to give the VPC a CIDR block. We're going to ensure the DNS settings are marked correctly. This ensures that we can get DNS names for our underlying virtual servers and also that DNS names can be resolved. We'll be looking more into DNS settings later on in this course when we look at the Route 53 service. We're then going to create a subnet with a subset of the CIDR block. <coughs> We are then going to create a subnet with a CIDR block. We are going to ensure the IP address settings for the subnet are correct. We are going to create a separate internet gateway. We are going to attach the internet gateway to our VPC. And then we are going to modify the route tables to ensure that if we spin up a virtual server in this new VPC, it would have the ability to communicate with the internet. And then finally, just to make sure that everything is working as it should, we are going to create an instance in our new VPC. So this is how it's going to look like. We're going to have a VPC, a subnet, we're going to have an EC2 instance, and that will communicate to the internet via the internet gateway. So let's go ahead and create our custom VPC. So here we are in our AWS console. Now we're going to go ahead to our VPC section since we are going to create a new VPC. Now there are two ways we can actually create a VPC. We could click on 
launch a VPC wizard has the name Dust Suggest. This gives you an easy wizard. This wizard will just ask you a couple of aspects for the VPC and the subnet and it will automatically create everything for you. There are four different options available. But when it comes to a solution architect associate and even for all of the subsequent associate and professional level exams, it's always important to understand how you can create a VPC from scratch. So let's do that. Let's cancel and exit from here. Let's go on to VPC and let's create a brand new VPC. Let's give the CIDR block. Let's leave the tenancy hazardous. Let's give a name tag for our VPC. So let's call this our demo VPC and click on create. So now we've created the home for our virtual servers on the cloud. So this is one separate part of the cloud which is dedicated for us. It has a CIDR block. Next, we need to go ahead and create a subnet. So the subnet will be used to host our virtual server. These are all the subnets for our default VPC. Let's go ahead and create a new subnet. Let's ensure that it's created in our new demo VPC. I'm going to give a name tag for the VPC. Now you can specify the availability zone over here. So remember that a subnet can only be mapped to one availability zone at a time, but you can have multiple subnets, each of them mapped to a different availability zone. So for the moment, I'm going to choose EU Central 1A. I'm going to mention a CIDR block. This is a subset of the main CIDR block of the VPC. I'll go ahead and create the subnet. So that's done. We've got one subnet that's part of our VPC. Now that our VPC and subnet are defined, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go to an internet gateway. This is the internet gateway that's attached to our default VPC. We can go ahead and create another internet gateway. I'm just going to give a name tag. You don't have to do anything else. I'm going to click on create. Now this internet gateway, the new one, is in the detached status. It's not attached to any VPC. So let's go ahead to actions. Let's click on attach to VPC. Let's choose our demo VPC and click on attach. Now please note that for this internet gateway which is attached to our default VPC, you can at any time unattach it from here, detach it from here and attach it to the demo VPC. But you can also go ahead and create a new internet gateway as we have done. Now we have to ensure that the settings for our VPC and subnet are in place. So let's go back to our VPC. Let's go to the demo VPC. What are two important settings is DNS resolution and DNS host names. So you can see the DNS host names is marked as no. This has to be a yes. So let's go ahead to actions. Let's click on edit DNS host names and let's mark it as yes. Click on save. Let's go to subnets. Let's click on our subnet. Let's go to actions. Let's click on modify auto assign IP settings. Now, what does this auto assign public IP settings mean? So when you create or spin up a server in the subnet, it will automatically be assigned a public IP address by AWS. Please note that in order for your instance to receive a public IP address, you have to make sure that this setting is marked as yes. 
when you create an EC2 instance, you do have the ability to override the setting, but just as a beginner, it's always good to ensure that you keep the setting as yes. So let's go ahead and click on modify auto assign public settings. Just check this, click on save. So we are done over here. Now the last bit that we need to do is go over to the route tables. There is a default route table that is created when you create the VPC. This is attached to both the VPC and the subnet. If you go on to the routes, you can see by default it will have the route for the internal communication within the VPC itself. In order to ensure that you can route traffic to the internet, we have to click on edit. Let's add another route. The default way to mark a destination as the internet is to put this particular CIDR block. So this ensures that any traffic that is destined for the internet will go via this route. And what is the target? It should go through our internet gateway. So let's choose our internet gateway, click on save. So all of our settings are in place. Now let's go over to AWS back. Let's go over now to EC2. And let's now launch an instance in our new VPC. So let's choose our same Ubuntu AMI. I'll keep it as t2.micro. Click on next. Now over here, you need to choose your new demo VPC. If you have more than one subnet, you can choose the subnet in which you want to create that virtual server. This is the auto assign public IP. So it's taking the setting from the subnet itself. You can override it over here as well. Next, let's leave all of the other settings as they are. We'll click on next to add storage. We'll add tags. So let's name this as Let's name this as demo Ubuntu so that we know that is created in our demo VPC. For the security group, if you try to select an existing one, you will not see the one we created earlier because that is part of our default VPC. We have to create a new security group. So let's name this as web server demo. Let's ensure that we can connect from the internet. Let's do a review and launch. Let's do a launch. Let's use the same key pair file. The key pair file is basically on a region basis. Let's launch the instance. And let's come back once the instance is in the running state. So now that our new server is up and running, I got put it here open. Let me copy the public IP address. I've already gone ahead and pasted the private key. Let's click on open. And now you can see we are connected to the Ubuntu server in our subnet. So over in this chapter, so in this chapter what we have done, we have spun up a new VPC, we spun up a new subnet, we create an internet gateway, we attach it to the VPC, we ensure the settings of the VPC and the subnet are correct. And then we ensure that the route table was modified so that requests could go through the internet gateway. So this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, I want to discuss private and public subnets. So I'm going to explain this via an example. So let's say we have a VPC. It has a CIDR block of 10.0. Dot zero, dot zero, dot zero slash 16. And what I've done is that I have defined two subnets. So one subnet has a CIDR block and another subnet has another CIDR block. 
Now I have some EC2 instances placed in the subnets. Now what is a public subnet? So any subnet which has the ability to route traffic via the internet gateway onto the internet so that maybe we can reach it from our workstation. This is known as a public subnet. Whereas a subnet which we want to keep private, we don't want anyone on the internet to have the ability to come to our subnet at all. We don't want to place any security group rules to restrict access. We just don't want traffic to come to the subnet at any cost. This is known as a private subnet. Now, why do we have private and public subnets? Let me just give you a simple scenario, which is important from an architect perspective. So let's say you have this EC2 instance, which is maybe hosting your web server. Now, obviously, the web server needs to be exposed to the internet so that users can access your web server or the website on this web server. Let's say now you have another server which is hosting your database. So this is a DB server, a database server. So you could be, it could, so it could be the case, this web server is interacting with this database server. So it fetches data from the database server and then it renders the pages and gives it to your users. Now, in such a scenario, it is not required for the database server to be exposed to the internet. That's not required. All that is required is that this EC2 instance has access to this database server and nothing else. That is why you would then isolate this instance in a subnet which has no connectivity to the internet. This is very important from an architect perspective. So a very simple scenario, a web server and a database server, they are split via these subnets. We actually have a demo in place in which I'm going to show you how to create private and public subnets. One more important point when it comes to defining, you know, how do you actually define a subnet to be private? How do you define a subnet to be public? This is done via the route table. In the route table, you have to mention specifically which subnet can route traffic to the internet. So in this case, in our demo, we now have to have two route tables. One route table for the public subnet which says that traffic can go to the internet. And then we have one more route table, which is for the private subnet, which says no traffic can go towards the internet. This is how we define a private and a public subnet. So we will see this in our demo. Hi, and welcome back. Now in this chapter, we are going to see how to add a private subnet to a VPC. So in an earlier chapter, what we've done is that when we created our own custom VPC, we also created a subnet. Since that subnet allowed public IP addresses and was part of the route table, which could route request via the internet gateway, it is known as a public subnet. But let's say we wanted to add a private subnet in which we didn't want the servers to have access to the internet. We would need to add this private subnet to our VPC. So we're going to add in our demo a new subnet to our existing demo VPC. This will be our private subnet. We're going to create a new route table. 
Now this new route table will be part and only required for our public subnet. The main route table will be shared between the VPC and the private subnet. So this is how it's going to look like. So we have our main route table which will not have a route to the internet gateway. This will be assigned to our VPC and our newly created private subnet. And then we have a new route table which is a custom route table which will have the internet gateway and that will be assigned to our public subnet. So now earlier what we had done is that in the main route table itself we had added the internet gateway. We now have to ensure that we make the change to delete that routing entry and instead add that routing entry to a new custom route table. So let's go ahead and implement these settings in the AWS console. So here we are in the AWS console. Let's go over to the VPC section. Let's go over to our VPCs. So we have our demo VPC, right? So this demo VPC is associated with a route table. This is our main route table. And if you go to our subnets, so our subnet A, now this subnet is like our public subnet because it has a route in the route table to the internet gateway. And we've already spun up a virtual server which is exposed to the internet in this subnet. So let's do one thing first. Let's change the name of the subnet to public subnet just for us to understand and know that this is our public subnet. Now let's go ahead and create a new private subnet. So let's choose our demo VPC. I'll give it a name tag of private subnet for the availability zone. I'll choose another availability zone. And I'll give another CIDR block for this private subnet. I'm going to go ahead and click on create, click on close. So now I have two subnets defined. Now I'm going to go over to my route tables. So this is the main route table which is assigned to my VPC and the subnet. I'm going to go over to the routes, click on edit and click on remove because this main route table is going to be associated with only the VPC and our private subnet. I'm going to click on save. Now we need to go and create a brand new route table. This will be a custom route table. Let's choose our demo VPC. I'm going to name this as public route. Click on yes, create. And before we actually modify this public route table, let me go to the private one and give a name tag so that we can easily distinguish between the different route tables. Now let's go back to our public route table. You can see that by default, it will always have this default route. So when you create a route table as per the VPC, this route will always be there. Now in this custom route table, let's click on edit and add the route for the internet. So everything remains the same. I'm going to click on save. Now let's go over to our subnets. Let's go to our public subnet. We now have to ensure that the public subnet is associated with our new route table because you can see that this public subnet is associated with our private route table which doesn't have a route to the internet. 
if you go over to the private subnet so you can see this is fine it's not supposed to have a route to the internet let's go back to the public subnet click on edit route table association choose our new route table you can see it has the internet gateway click on save and now you have the public subnet which has connectivity to the internet over here is our virtual server which is in the public subnet in our new VPC you can see that it's still working we can also issue a command we can see that it's still connected to the internet so our public subnet is hazardous the only difference is that we have created a new custom route table now if you spin up a new virtual server in the private subnet let's do that let's go back to AWS let's go to EC2 let's launch a new instance let's choose it has Ubuntu itself let's leave it as t2.micro let's go on to next now over here let's choose our demo VPC we'll choose our private subnet now you can see that in that private subnet we ensured that we did not enable that auto assign public IP because since this is a private subnet we should not have public IPs attached to this EC2 instance so I'm going to go ahead let's leave everything as it is I'm just going to add a name tag click on next this time I'm just going to choose to create a new security group now over here even though we have a security group to connect from anywhere we will still not be able to connect from our workstation simply because this instance will not have a public IP and because the subnet does not have a route to the internet but let's leave it as it is let's click on review and launch click on launch acknowledge we have the key pair and launch the instance so let's come back once we have this instance in the running state so now that our new instance our demo private instance is up and running you can now see it doesn't have a public DNS name neither does it have a public IP address it only has a private DNS name and a private IP address so now we have a private EC2 instance in a private subnet in a VPC so this marks the end of this chapter when we go over to our subsequent chapter on bastion hosts we will see how we can connect to this private server from another server in our public subnet for now this marks the end of this chapter hi and welcome back now in the last chapter we had seen how to define private and public subnets now I want to talk about two more concepts first is the communication between the virtual servers or your EC2 instances in a VPC so I did mention that internal communication between the virtual servers is possible by default so if you wanted let's say this server to talk to this server so in the last example I said imagine that this could be your web server this could be a database server this communication by default will happen using the private IP of the instance so remember in our introduction to VPCs and the EC2 instances I said that a virtual server can have a public IP and a private IP the public IP is used for communication on the internet 
and the private IP is used for internal communication. This is all done or all assigned to the elastic network interface. So this is like a virtual network card assigned to the virtual server. So all the communication will happen via the private IP. Now, please note that we had already also seen security groups earlier. So one important point or note, if you want the communication to happen, ensure that the security groups allow the communication, right? So if you want this EC2 instance to communicate to this one and vice versa, you have to ensure that if you have a separate security group for this instance, it allows communication from this instance and the same vice versa. Now I've also included one more instance and that's for my second point. Now let's say you wanted to connect to this instance. So I said that let's say you want to host a database on this instance. Now obviously you need to log in, you want to install the database software, you want to like you know manage that server. So how do you do that? Because remember, this is in the private subnet. You can't communicate via your workstation. So from your workstation, if you wanted to manage the server, how would you do it? As an architect, this is how you would manage your solution. You would create one more virtual server in the public subnet. This is normally known as the bastion host or a jump server. The sole purpose of this server is only to administer the internal machines. So what you would do, you would ensure that your workstation could go via the internet gateway to this virtual machine, you would log on to this virtual machine and from this virtual machine, you would then secure shell to this virtual server and do the administration. Also very important, since the server is exposed to the internet, you have to ensure that in the security groups, you only allow communication from your workstation. So if your workstation has a public IP address, you have to ensure that only this IP address is part of the security group and has access to the bastion host. So I've just talked about two concepts. One is the internal communication between virtual servers and the concept of the bastion host. We're going to look at both of these in a demo. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, let's go through bastion hosts. Now bastion host is nothing but a virtual server in the public subnet. So if an IT administrator wants to connect and administer servers in a private subnet, then they could connect to a separate machine which is set up in the public subnet. This is known as a bastion host or a jump server. The IT admin will then connect to the private server via the public server. This would be the only sole responsibility of this bastion host or EC2 instance. It would only serve as a jump server to ensure that it could connect to virtual machines in the private subnet. So now in our early example, in our custom VPC, we had spun up two virtual servers. One was a demo Ubuntu, which was in a public subnet. Let's assume that this is our bastion host. So we can connect to this from our laptop because it has a public IP. It is in the public subnet. We can reach it from the internet. We had also spun up a demo private instance in a private subnet. Now this private instance only has a private IP. It doesn't have a public IP. So we are going to connect to it from our demo Ubuntu instance. So first we are going to connect from our workstation to demo Ubuntu instance 
and from that machine we are then going to connect to our demo private instance so let's see how we can get this done so here we are back in the EC2 dashboard now we are going to connect to our demo private instance from our demo Ubuntu instance now some prerequisites which you need to do now if you go over to the demo private and you click on connect so in connect it says that in order to connect using the private IP of this address you have to issue this command so this is the username along with the private IP address but it also says that you should have the private key file or the PEM file so remember this is the private key file which you have created when you launch your EC2 instance this is your private key file so you have to ensure that this file is in place on our public server so what I've done I've used a file transfer tool I will attach has a link to this chapter where you can download the tool and install it I have connected via the public IP address demo Ubuntu instance I have gone ahead and copied the EC2 demo private key file so again remember if I go back to the EC2 dashboard if I go over to our demo private this is the key pair file which you have specified when you launched the EC2 instance so you have to copy this from your local machine using a file transfer tool onto the public server now this is my public server I've already gone ahead and logged into the public server if I do an ls I can see that ec 2 demopem file now if I just go ahead again click on demo private click on connect it says that you also must issue this command to ensure the right permissions are put on the private key file to connect so I'm going to go ahead and copy this I'll go back to my instance I'll just do a sudo copy the command execute it that's done now let me copy this entire command go back and now what I'm doing is that I am connecting to the private instance from a public server it's that simple so now I am actually connected to demo private so if you go to this instance you can see that the private IP is 10.0.2.49 and you can confirm this has a private IP for your demo private instance so this is how you would connect to a private server from a public server in a VPC so this marks the end of this chapter hi and welcome back now in this chapter I want to talk about NAT or network address translation now when do you need a NAT service so let's say we have our similar architecture where we have a web server in a public subnet and a database server in a private subnet now I already have one chapter where I've discussed something known as a bastion host wherein the bastion host allows for secure communication between your console it talks to the bastion host and then you connect to the server to do your administration but let's say you need outgoing traffic so let's say you need this EC2 instance to download updates so it could be OS level updates it could be database server updates from the internet so you need this server to go to the internet get the updates and install it now since again this is in the private subnet it has 
no communication with the outside world. In such a case, you would use a special device known as NAT or Network Address Translation. Remember, you would not use a bastion host, you would use a NAT instance. So what does the NAT do? The NAT allows your servers in the private subnet to communicate with the internet in a secure manner. How is this secure? So when this instance needs to communicate to the internet, the request will go to a special device known as a NAT instance or something known as a NAT gateway in AWS. When it goes to the NAT instance, the NAT instance will make the request on behalf of this instance to the internet, get whatever is required and then relay it back to the virtual server in the private subnet. So this is like your intermediate buddy which is getting all the request, fetching it from the internet and passing it back. So it is not exposing this server to the internet. Internally, it does something known as network address translation, wherein all the IP addresses, you know, when the request is made to the internet, it will have the IP address of this instance and not this instance. I am not going into depth into network address translation. As an architect, you have to understand that the main concept behind having a NAT device is to ensure that servers in your private subnet can communicate with the internet. Now in AWS, there are two ways that you can provision this device. One is known as a NAT instance and another is known as a NAT gateway. A NAT instance is a special type of server. So you would spin up an additional EC2 instance. This will be built out of a special Amazon machine image. So there are already special Amazon machine images which has this sort of NAT facility or software already installed. You just spin up the instance. The instance needs to be spun up in the public subnet because remember, this server communicates to the internet on behalf of the server in the private subnet. So this instance has to be in the public subnet. So two requirements. First is build it out of the AMI from AWS. We'll actually see all of this in a demo. Secondly, ensure that it's in a public subnet. And there is a third and fourth important point. So the third thing is something known as a source destination check. You will see this in our demo. We actually have to disable this. And fourth, you have to ensure that the security groups for this NAT instance allows the communication from this EC2 instance. That's normal in terms of security groups. We're going to see all of this in a demo. So this is the NAT instance. You can also use a device, which is a NAT gateway. This is like an internet gateway. It's a fully managed service. So you don't need the NAT instance. You can provision another device known as a NAT gateway. Now, when would you use the NAT gateway? I have a special chapter anyway already on this, but just to give you a heads up, remember this is an instance. It's routing all the traffic and getting everything back. So this instance has a particular amount of CPU, network, etc. You know, the amount that it can handle. If you have a lot of instances in the private subnet and all of this start hitting the NAT instance, the NAT instance might become a bottleneck. So you might have to upgrade it to a higher instance type. So you are basically maintaining this instance. But AWS, like the Internet Gateway, has something known as a NAT gateway where you don't need to manage anything at all. Everything is managed by AWS. So all the requests can go to the NAT gateway. You are not bothered at all. It has high bandwidth, high availability. You can even make it more available by specifying multiple subnets. And everything will be managed by AWS. 
So all you have to do is ensure that the NAT, that the EC2 instance can reach the NAT gateway. Now, another important thing which I forgot to mention is that when you're using either the NAT instance or the NAT gateway, you have to also do one more thing and that is the route table. You have to ensure that the route table which is attached to the private subnet has a route entry to say that if any traffic needs to go to the internet, like you want to fetch the updates, then it has to go through either the NAT instance or the NAT gateway, right? So this is just an important point as well, right? So here I've discussed the NAT instance and the NAT gateway. We're going to see a demo on all of this. Hi, and welcome back. Now in this chapter, we will look at a demo on network address translation. So in this demo, we will see how to work with a NAT instance. So we are first going to launch a NAT instance from a special AMI. This will be launched, remember, in our public subnet because the NAT instance needs to have the ability to reach the internet on behalf of the instance in your private subnet. We are then going to ensure that we disable the source destination check for the NAT instance. We're going to modify our private route table so that requests can be routed via the NAT instance to the internet. We're going to modify our security groups as well. So this is how it would actually look like. So we have our server in our private subnet. This would then talk to a NAT instance in our public subnet. We have to ensure that our main route table now also has a destination which goes to the internet, but this time via our NAT instance. So let's go to the AWS console and see how we can get this done. So here we are back in the AWS console. Now in an earlier chapter, we had seen how we could connect to a private server from a public server. So I have the putty session open to the private server from the public server. So if I just exit from here, I'm actually now logged on to our public server. And if I do a ping to the internet, I can see I'm getting a response back. This ensures that the server is in the public subnet. Now I'm going to cancel from here. I'm going to go ahead and again connect to our private server. And this time let's issue the same ping command. And we can see that we can't ping the outside world because this server, as I said, is in the private subnet. So let's say we want this server to communicate with the internet in a secure manner, we need to spin up a NAT instance in the public subnet. So let's go ahead and launch an instance. Now this time we have to choose a special type of instance. So we have to go to community AMIs. Let's search for NAT, that is network address translation. So we can choose whatever comes at the top. So this should be the most recent one. So let's select that. Let's leave it as t2.micro. Let's configure the instance details. So I'm going to create this in our demo VPC, in our public subnet, ensure that it has a public IP. Let's go on to next for storage. Leave it as it is. I'm going to add a name value tag just to showcase that this is our NAT server. We'll configure the security group. So let's create a new one. Now we don't necessarily have to connect to the NAT instance. We just have to ensure that the NAT instance allows communication anywhere on the internet. So if you want to download, uh, so if you want the instances 
to download updates via the HTTP protocol, then we would ensure that the NAT server security group allows that port range to be open on the internet. So I'm going to click review and launch. I will click on launch. I will acknowledge that I have access to the key pair file and click on launch instances. Now let's wait till this instance is up and running. So right we are back, our NAT server is up and running. Now some core aspects for this NAT server. Firstly, we have to ensure that we go on to actions. We have to go on to networking and disable the source destination check. This is required when you have a NAT instance in place. So now that we have our NAT server running, we have to ensure that our private route tables let me open the VPC dashboard in another tab. Let me go over to VPC. Let's go over to our route tables. Our private route table currently has no route that can actually expose it to the internet. And we don't want to add the internet gateway, then this will just make this as another public subnet. But we need to have secure communication via the NAT instance. So we have to edit this and add a route to the NAT instance. So similarly, how we would add a route to the Internet Gateway by specifying this IP address range. Only this time, we will choose the target has our NAT server. So you can see now this is also coming up has an option over here. And that's because it has been spun up by using a special type of AMI that's available from AWS. Let's choose this and click on save. So let's now go over to our private server. So remember this had no connectivity to the internet. Now if I issue an app get install Apache 2, so I'm basically trying to install Apache. Now this should work because this is going via TCP port 80. It's getting all the packages via H TTP and now it would be going via our NAT instance. So you can see now this is working. We are actually on our private server, but now we can download the updates from the internet. Please note that the ping command will still not work. So if you try to ping, right, that would still not work. And that's because of the security group assigned to our NAT instance. So if you go over to the EC2 management dashboard, if you go over to our NAT server, go to the NAT server security group for the inbound, we can click on edit, add another rule for all ping traffic. And let's click on save. Let's add the IP address range. Click on save. Now let's go over to the instance. Let's do a ping again. And now you can see you're able to ping the internet. So this is all based on the security groups which you assign to the NAT instance. But now you can see that your server now in the private subnet can communicate with the internet in a secure manner. Now remember how this is different from an internet gateway in an internet gateway, people from the outside can connect to your server. But in a NAT server scenario, no one from the outside can connect to the server in your private subnet. It is only the servers in the private subnet which can communicate with the outside world. So there is a very key difference over here. And obviously based on what I explained in an earlier chapter that even the IP address of the private server is not exposed when the request goes to the internet. So this marks the end of this chapter on how we can create and work with a NAT instance. Hi and welcome back. Now in an earlier chapter, 
we had seen how we could work with the NAT instance which was used to ensure that your EC2 servers in the private subnet could communicate with the internet. Now AWS provides another service known as the NAT Gateway. This is a fully managed service by AWS. So here you don't need to create an instance and maintain it. Everything will be done for you by the NAT Gateway service. So if you're building your own VPC from scratch now, it's always advisable to build the NAT Gateway primarily because it's a fully managed service. You don't have to worry about the bandwidth restrictions. So remember, when you're using your NAT instance, you have to worry about the bandwidth of the underlying instance. You have to maintain the instance. You have to ensure that the right security patches are installed on the instance. A lot of maintenance work from your side. But when it comes to the NAT gateway, it can be done easily, everything for you by AWS. So in your VPC dashboard, there is a particular section known as NAT Gateway. You can go ahead and click on Create NAT Gateway, as simple as that. You have to ensure that you choose your public subnet. The NAT Gateway needs to be created in the public subnet. Now, if you want to know what is the public subnet, let's go over to another tab. Let's go to AWS, let's go to our VPC dashboard. Let's go over to our subnets. So our public subnet has the ending digits of 39. So let's choose that. Now it will automatically allocate an elastic IP address for you. So let's just create a new elastic IP address. That's done for us and let's create the NAT gateway. Now, as simple as that, you didn't have to launch an instance, wait for it to be up and running, change the security groups, change the source destination check, nothing. We just created a device. If you just click on close quickly, so you can see currently it's in the pending state, it's being provisioned. Let's wait till the status has been changed. Now, once the NAT server, has been provisioned and is in the available status. We can now go on to our route table. So let's go back to our route tables. Let's go over to our private route table. Click on routes. Click on edit. So now currently this is pointing to our NAT instance. We now have another entry for our NAT gateway. Let's choose that. Click on save. So here I'm back in our private instance. Now if I do a ping command again, it's working as it should. Now only some key differences as I mentioned that use a NAT gateway when you don't want any restrictions on the bandwidth, uh, when you don't want to maintain the underlying instance. But in the NAT gateway, one key thing to note is that you can't work with security groups. You can't define what is the security policy that should be applied to the NAT gateway? So what is the traffic? You would probably have to control this at the EC2 instance level. So these are just some notable differences when you are working with the NAT gateway. So this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, we are going to go through the concept of VPC peering. So VPC peering allows communication across your VPCs. So remember each VPC is an isolated network on the AWS cloud. So since it is isolated, you cannot have communication across resources in different VPCs just like that. In order to ensure communication, you have to do something known as VPC peering. Now in VPC peering, the VPCs can be in different regions. They can also be in different AWS accounts. So this is a scenario. You have two VPCs, your virtual private cloud. In order to establish communication between resources in these VPCs, you establish 
of APC peering connection. Now one key thing to note is that after you establish the connection, just like a normal VPC where you have to work with the routing tables, ensure the routing tables are modified so that resources in each VPC can reach the resources in the other VPC. And also, just like security groups for your instances in a VPC, ensure that if you want communication across resources in different VPCs, modify the security groups to ensure this communication happens. Now some important aspects when it comes to VPC peering. So this is important from all exam perspectives. First thing is transitive routing is not possible. And what do I mean by transitive routing? Let's say you've established a VPC peering connection between VPC A and VPC B. Next, let's say you establish a VPC peering connection between VPC B and VPC C. Now you would assume that since there are interconnections between these VPCs, that traffic should be possible to flow directly between VPC A and VPC C. But this is not the case. So this is what I mean by transitive routing is not possible. Just because there is you know, a, a VPC peering connection between B and C, don't assume that traffic can flow directly between A and C. For this, you need to do a complete mesh configuration as shown here. So here you have VPC peering connections between each required VPC. This is how you can achieve routing between VPCs. Next, if either VPC has a VPN connection or a direct connect connection or an internet gateway or a VPC endpoint, again, the routing will not occur. Let's take an example. Let's say you have VPC A that has a peering connection against VPC B. Let's say VPC B has a connection to a corporate data center. This could be via direct connect or a VPN connection. Again, do you assume that traffic can flow between A and the corporate data center? Well, no. Traffic cannot be directed from a VPC peering connection to a corporate data center using any one of these artifacts which have been stated above. So again, this is another very important aspect. VPC A will not be able to send traffic to the corporate data center via VPC B. So these are some very important aspects when it comes to VPC peering connections. This marks the end of this chapter. Let's move on to the next chapter in this course. So here we are in the AWS console. Now what we are going to do is that we are going to create a VPC peering connection. I have two VPCs. I have a test VPC that has this SIDA block and I have a staging VPC which has another SIDA block. So let's go ahead and create a VPC peering connection between these two VPCs. Now in the VPC dashboard section, go on to peering connections. Here is where you can actually go ahead and create a peering connection between VPCs. So let's go ahead and create a peering connection. Let's give a name tag for the peering connection. We can put any VPC at the moment has the requester. So I'm going to put the staging VPC has the requester. Now since the VPC is in my own account and in the same region, I will put the test VPC has the VPC to peer with. Please note that you can also create a peering connection with a VPC in another account or even if the VPC is in another region. But since both our VPCs are in the same account, and in the same region, 
let's go ahead and create the peering connection so that's done so now if you look at our BPC peering connection it's in pending acceptance that's because the test VPC so the destination VPC account holder has to accept the VPC peering connection now since I am the account owner for both the staging and the test VPC I can go ahead to actions and say accept request so yes I am now accepting the request and now my BPC peering connection is active so now both VPCs are peer together but now we have to ensure that we change the routing tables on both the VPCs to allow traffic to flow between the VPCs themselves so let's go ahead and do that so note that now just like an internet gateway connection for the peering connection we have an ID so remember that in the route tables we are going to add this ID so let's go to our subnets now in my staging public subnet so I want this subnet to have the routing capabilities to route traffic to the test VPC so I will go to the route table let me go and click on the route table so this will open the route table console let me click on the route let me go on to routes let me click on edit let me add a rule so now let me say that for any traffic which is going to the destination SIDA block of the test VPC so this is a SIDA block of the test VPC go through the peering connection and then let me click on save now that that is done let me go back to my subnets now I want to do the same for my test VPC because I want the direction of traffic to be both ways so I'm going to choose a subnet which I want to route traffic from so this is going to be the subnet in the test VPC in AP Southeast 1B I am going to do the same thing I am going to go to my route table I am going to go to the route table definition so I'm going to click on the route table I am going to add one more route and this time around I'm going to say that I want to add the CIDR block of the staging VPC and I'm going to choose my test staging target connection click on save so now what we've done what we've achieved we've created the VPC peering connection and we have modified the route tables so this is how we can set up the VPC peering connection now once your route tables are in place that means routing is enabled between the VPCs then you can run your applications and if you want to route packets between these VPCs you can do so so for example I have a MySQL database that's running uh, in my test VPC and I have a staging web server so that's an Apache web server that's running in my staging VPC now since I've already enabled a VPC peering connection between these VPCs what I can do is that I now have the ability for the web server to communicate with the database server so here I just have a sample PHP page this is being hosted on the web server in the staging VPC it is then communicating with the database in the test VPC via a private IP if we didn't have the peering connection this would not work out but since we have peered both the VPCs I have now the ability to make my web server in one VPC talk to the database server in another VPC one quick note apart from modifying the route tables ensure that the security groups are set for the servers 
So the concept of security groups and network access controllers stay the same. So ensure that you allow access accordingly to ensure that the web server can talk to the database server. This marks the end of this chapter. Let's move on to the next chapter in this course. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, we are going to go through the concept of VPC endpoints. Now a VPC endpoint allows your instance which is located in a private subnet to communicate with public services such as S3 or DynamoDB. Now in this slide I have a VPC, I have two subnets, a public subnet and a private subnet and I have an instance in each of these subnets. Now let's say you want an instance to access an S3 bucket. Remember that services such as S3 and DynamoDB are public services. That means if you want your instance to access any of these services, so either S3 or DynamoDB, the instance needs to be placed in a public subnet which has access to the internet. So this is the scenario which is required for an instance to access an S3 bucket. But due to security reasons, it's not always ideal just to place an instance in a public subnet if it needs to access, for example, an S3 bucket. In such a case, you can use a VPC endpoint and then place your instance in a private subnet. So just like NAT instance or a NAT gateway, the VPC endpoints allow an instance to route requests to public services via that public endpoint. So this negates the requirement of having that instance in a public subnet. All you do is create a VPC endpoint and then you should be able to access your S3 bucket. So the high level steps are very easy. Just create a VPC endpoint, specify the service which you want to access via that endpoint and then attach it to the VPC. And then finally ensure that the route tables are changed for the private subnet. So now in our demo, we are going to do the same thing. So I have again a VPC with two subnets. I have an instance in my public subnet. I will use that instance to uh, secure shell into the instance in my private subnet. Firstly, from my private subnet, I will try to issue the command to list the buckets in S3. That should fail. Then I will create a VPC endpoint and show how the endpoint can be used to mitigate the issue of accessing S3. So let's now move on and see how we can work through this in our demo. So here I am in the AWS console. Now I have two servers running in a VPC. So I have this Ubuntu server which is running in a private subnet. So it does not have a public IP address. It only has a private IP address. Next I have the public server. So this is located in a public subnet in the same VPC. It has a public IP address. Now what I've done is that I've actually logged into the private server using the public server has a jump server. So now from this server which is in the private subnet, so let me go on to Ubuntu just to confirm that this is the private IP address, so 20.0.1.84. Right, so this is the same server. Now if I try to list the buckets in S3, so I want this instance to have the capability to list the buckets in S3. Please also note that I have attached a role to this instance to access the S3 service. So ensure that is also in place that you have an IAM role that allows EC2 read-only access onto S3. So let me go on and execute the command. But what you're going to see is that, that this command will not execute. And that's because this EC2 instance 
is not able to contact the, the S3 service. And I said, this is because the S3 service is a public service. And hence this instance needs to be on the public subnet. But this instance is in the private subnet. So how do we allow this instance to access S3? So I said the mitigation for this is to ensure that we have a VPC endpoint. So let me cancel out of this command. So let me go on to the VPC dashboard. So this is the VPC dashboard. Now we have this link for endpoint. So let's choose endpoint and let's create a new endpoint. So here you have the different gateways that are available. So there is one for S3 and there is one for DynamoDB. Now, since we want to use the gateway service for S3, we are going to choose that. Next, go ahead and choose the VPC. Now, both of my instances are located in VPC B. So I will choose VPC B. I will associate this VPC endpoint with my private subnet. So I want the instance in my private subnet to use this VPC endpoint to access S3. Now, if you want manually, you can go and create a route entry. By default, this will create the route entry for you. You then decide upon the policy. I'm going to go ahead and put the full access policy for now. And I'm going to go ahead and create the endpoint. I'm going to close this. Now, if you go on to the route table, so let me go on to the route tables. So I have my VPC B route. Now, after a couple of minutes, when you go to the route table for your private subnet, so even if you go to the endpoints, and if you go on to route tables, you can also go to the subnet route table from here itself. Click on the subnet, go on to route tables. And now you can see that there is an endpoint entry which is created for you. So you just need to wait a couple of minutes. The endpoint needs to be provisioned and then added to the route table. So now we are back in our instance. So now let's issue the command to list the buckets. Now just remember that this VPC endpoint is given particular access to the AP Southeast 1 region. So when we now issue the API command for listing buckets, you have to mention the region as well as AP Southeast 1. So now when you actually issue the command, you will see that you get the required bucket list. So now this access is coming via the VPC endpoint. So this is how you can use VPC endpoints to access resources, public resources in AWS. So for now, this marks the end of this chapter. Let's move on to the next chapter in this course. Hi, and a warm welcome back. Now, I hope you liked the course. Again, if you have any sort of feedback, do message me. Do let me know on how I can improve upon the course. If you want to learn more about AWS, as I mentioned before in the beginning of the course, then you have to look at other courses on the Udemy platform as well. Now, from my aspect, I am leaving a bonus lecture. So in that, I'm actually going to give you discount coupon links in which you can enroll in my other courses. So I have courses on the AWS Solution Architect Associate. I have courses on the AWS Security Specialist. I also have even courses on the Azure platform. So depending on what you like, if you want to learn more, if you like the way I'm teaching, this is the way I teach in all of my courses. So if you are comfortable, if you like, please do enroll in the course if you want to learn further. Wishing you all the best in your journey on